So um, welcome everybody to this uh, virtually hosted event by the University of Hull uh, with the support of the University of York. Uh, and thank you to everyone um, who's giving up their time to be here today. It's, it's greatly appreciated. The event literally would not exist without you. Um, so that's wonderful. Um, so this is the first of a series of events that have been that are being put on by the Screen Industries Growth Network. Um, the, the reason that the University of Hull chose the particular topic of today's session is that the university as a whole has a commitment to um, widening participation and trying to identify and remove obstacles that um, our students might face in trying to pursue um, fulfilling careers. So that kind of inspired the, the particular topic that we chose. Um, okay, so yeah, that's just a brief welcome from me. I'm going to hand over to Laura now, who's going to give you a brief outline of the structure of the day. Uh, thanks, James. Uh, yeah, so uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, the topic of today's discussion is something that is very close to our hearts here at Hull. Um, so we're very keen uh, to kind of talk about things like uh, you know, helping young people to get into the screen industries. Um, we are particularly kind of uh, concerned with that. So that's why we chose to have this be the focus of our session in particular. Um, I found that kind of teaching in Hull over the past couple of years, um, I've found a kind of very enthusiastic and engaged student body. Um, and our student body uh, in screen here is also, um, we have a high proportion of students who are from, uh, low participation backgrounds uh, or backgrounds where um, you know they, they're the first person in their families to go to university um, so it is something that kind of concerns us um, and essentially today I want to get us all together in the room so we've got representatives from uh, industry we've got uh, representatives from local further education colleges um, and we'd really like to get you chatting about kind of identifying uh, you know, partly skills gaps in the sector, but also how we can communicate with young people who want to pursue a screen industries career. How we open up those avenues and those routes. Um, what can we actually do? Um, so that's kind of the focus of our discussion. And we'll be kind of drawing on uh, all of your expertise uh, for this. Um, so in our first session, uh, our plenary session, uh, we'd like to kind of discuss as a panel um, among all of us uh, what we think are the key problems or issues or areas for improvement in guiding young people to screen industries careers but also kind of through screen industries careers. Now I know that a lot of people in this room are very engaged in doing that. You've come here and given a lot of talks, you've mentored students, um, you're always very generous with your time um, and you've sort of gained insights into what those challenges are. So I think it's great to have us all together in a virtual room to kind of share those experiences. Um, so what we will do is invite responses from uh, the people in the panel. Uh, and the kind of focus of this first session will be, you know, what do you think are those problems and how can we improve them? And then we'll have a break and we will actually go into kind of smaller breakout rooms. Um, and one of us will kind of, me or James or John Swords will kind of be in those rooms and we'll kind of direct discussion and we'll kind of report back as a group. Um, so that's kind of the rundown of the afternoon. Um, I think uh, we're going to hand over to Catherine Hardman now, who is going to welcome everyone on behalf of the Screen Industries Growth Network, who are, uh, along with the University of Hull, running this event. Is that okay, Catherine? That's absolutely fine. Uh, James, do you have my, do you want to screen share my slides, please? James Wilson, thank you. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, so I'm, I'm really pleased to have the opportunity here as the third person to welcome you uh, as people come into the room um, to welcome you to this first of our seminar series with Hull. I'm Catherine Hardman and I'm the Partnerships and Strategy Manager for the um, Screen Industries Growth Net Network. And it falls to me to welcome you colleagues from the University of Hull and thank them for leading us in this today's seminar. 
I'd also like to thank John Swords, Science Research Lead, for establishing this seminar series. And um, we hope this is going to be the first of, of many very interesting sessions. And finally, but not least of all, I'd like to welcome you, our virtual audience. Can I have my next slide, please, James? Thank you. Um, before we started the proceedings, I'd like very briefly to set this seminar in the wider context of the SIGN project. So SIGN aims to make the region, this region, Yorkshire and Humberside, the UK centre for digital creativity and a model for diverse and inclusive activity. In order to do this, we connect companies, support agencies and universities through a programme of training, business development, research and evaluation. And I find what makes this initiative so exciting is its regional context. So between 2015 and 2018, this region has seen growth in the screen industries that far outstrips that of the UK in general. And we've seen an increase in growth of 116% in comparison with the rest of the UK, which had a growth of about 11%. There's a similarly impressive change in the number of screen industry workers in comparison with the rest of the UK too. And it was within that context that SIGN received £6.4 million in funding from Research England, the University of York and its partners uh, to be able to, to help uh, enable that growth. York leads the initiative, working very closely with Screen Yorkshire and eight other Yorkshire and Humber universities. One of those universities we are very proud to work with is the University of Hull, whose seminar topic today, From Courses to Careers, I think serves ably to demonstrate how underlying research can feed into very real world change and contribute uh, to making the region a centre of excellence that we all, we all aim to, to achieve. So with that, I'm gonna hand back over to Laura, James and John to take us through the rest of the afternoon, which I'm sure will be uh, prove a very interesting and um, invigorating conversations. So thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, John, did you want to say anything before we launch into the, the first panel discussion? Yeah, I'll just introduce myself. I'm John Swords. I'm a senior research fellow at the University of York. And as Catherine says, I, I lead the research work strand um, of the Screen Industries Growth Network. Um, I'll be helping out today. And um, if there's some really good ideas, we may be able to fund some research um, into some of the topics that we discussed today. <clears throat> That's great. Thanks, John. Okay, so um, the first session that we have is is a panel discussion. Um, so when we get to the the breakout rooms later, um, everyone, um, delegates and panelists will be contributing. But for this session, um, it's going to be I'm going to call on the panelists in turn to to briefly sort of set out their stall, if you like, um, and raise some issues that we're hoping we'll be able to follow through with and and think through as we move through the sessions. So. The way, the way we figured we'd, we would do it is I would like to call on each panelist in turn and I've, I've put you in the order which I think roughly approximates the order in which a young person moving through their sort of um, learning and career journey might encounter you or encounter sort of the work that you're involved with. Um, if anyone, um, if any other panelist wants to sort of briefly chip in, um, please raise your hand and I'll try and um, spot that and, and invite you to to unmute and, and speak, um, but I've got a list and, and I will sort of call on people in turn. Everyone, um, delegates and panelists alike, please feel free to use the chat function if you want to um, sort of drop a comment in there rather than speak up. Um, depending on the fl how much material comes into the chat, we might not have time to respond to it all as we go along, but it, it will be there um, on the record for everyone to see and think about. And as I say, a lot of this will, will carry forward into the, the sessions. So this is likely to be quite brisk because we've got a lot of panelists and not a huge amount of time. Um, but um, hopefully we'll, we'll get some uh, lots of interesting thoughts um, to, to follow up with. OK, so the question, um, as we phrased it um, going into this session, is what would you highlight as, as key problems or areas for improvement in guiding young people through courses and onto careers? So this could be both things like what you perceive as potential blockages or failures of communication and understanding when it comes to the way that we work together to try and produce um, you know, um, prepared graduates who go on to successful careers. It could also be, be something more benign. So it's not necessarily a problem. It's just something you encounter time and again and, 
and something you, where you have to provide particular attention or support or be aware of it when you're dealing with these young people who are trying to, um, yeah, propel forwards onto, onto their screen careers. So I gave her advance warning. Um, I'm calling first on, on Margaret, um, from who is head of careers at Screen Skills and who has worked with um, young people from school age and upwards. So Margaret, over to you. Um, thank you. I am in the office, so I apologise for background noise. I've got noise suppression on, but I'm not always sure it works. Um, so we look at screen industries as film, television, visual effects, animation and games. Um, we're also dabbling with immersive and virtual production, which is quite a big thing that's coming up that all students should be aware of, although we're only getting our heads around it now. Um, things that we've got is on our website we've got some well over 200 job profiles and that's one of the problems everybody wants to be a director make their own animations make their own films make design their own games and it's a team sport what we do any content that we make is part of a team so information about all those different jobs is part of what we are trying to promote. We also work with the rest of the creative industries on a DCM, what was a DCMS funded project called Discover Creative Careers, which is for the whole of the creative industries. And there's a Discover Creative Careers website, which has about, uh, which links out to sort of 600 job profiles, everything from jewellery making to, to interior design. So that's really useful as well. So we are doing a lot of that stuff. Um, all the growth figures that we've got, or a lot of them are pre-COVID, which is problematic. So the biggest complaint I get now from it, because we're industry led, we're, we're funded by industry mainly, uh, the BFI skills funds for high end television and film animation uh, skills fund, that sort of thing, uh, is employability. So for all our select courses where we um, evaluate the courses we are now doing employability modules for, for final year students I have to say that they don't always turn up although it's really useful stuff we're just about to publish tomorrow for online e-learning employability modules because employers are saying to us that students are not work ready we get that all the time and this is soft skills it's not about um, being able to make the most wonderful animation in the world or the most wonderful film it's about working in a team turning up on time all of those really, really basic things. And I think we've lost a lot of that because there've been no placements, we've had no set visits, all of that sort of thing during lockdown. Uh, but employability is knowing that you can do it because most, uh, we do a tiny bit with primary, although Interfilm does more, we've, done a, we've got some lesson plans, but knowing what the range of jobs are is the start and, and having the confidence that as a school child, you could go and do a creative career. And then the reality of what that is um, in that uh, I was only reading something from an animation studio who are saying, you know, somebody's come out and I think they're going to do everything. And actually, we want them to draw the same thing over and over and over again, um, because they're working on a particular thing to a time scale. We're a commercial organization and they've been used to just having free reign at university or whatever to make their own stuff. So those are the, some of the things I, I would think range of jobs, employability are big things for me. Thanks. That's that's wonderful, and a lot, yeah, a lot of what you said really resonates with um, other conversations I've heard and and personal experience. And thanks for highlighting, in summary, the range of jobs and uh, as as a, a major issue um, that that's useful to know and the soft skills thing as well. Okay, um, we have two um, representatives with us from Pearson. Um, we've got Joel Cable, who's sector manager for art and design and creative media, and we've got Scott Santos, who is chief examiner for BTEC Creative Media. Joel, can I call on you first, and then Scott to um, to address this question from your perspective? Well, I think Margaret stole my thunder a bit. I've worked with Margaret a little bit. Um, we've we've tried to kind of, uh, I wouldn't say usurp, but we've tried to link into those amazing job profiles. Um, that, that kind of wealth of knowledge that Screen Skills works with others in the creative industries to to produce, um, and they're they're just so highly valuable. And we really need the learners that we um, you know educate at levels two and three to be aware at an early age of the the whole range of possibilities within the screen uh, industries. And I, I think you know I was thinking the same thing when you asked the question. I was thinking the same thing that Margaret said about. Um, the, the number of learners that we get through that talk about wanting to be a director or that don't have a, you know, a 
a wider scope of what is available and how teams work together to produce you know all the great content that we see um, in the screen industries um, so it's about making you know making learners at a younger age aware of that range and starting to find their place as well because you know it's it's about the skill set i think it's about how dif different individuals take to different um skills that are required to do those different jobs some some being much more technically minded some being more visual some being more um uh maybe project management driven um so those those kinds of things and understanding how they, they fit in and it's also for us it's a little bit about making sure that teachers um, are fully informed because um, as margaret said things um, in terms of you know virtual augmented immersive uh, reality those things are at the, at the forefront and the technology is changing fast and teachers are not always able to to um, you know immerse themselves in being able to educate so it's it's about um, trying to bring that those those opportunities to teachers at least making them aware of the need um, and the, the growth of the industry in those areas we've got some new um, esports level two and level three qualifications that we've produced that you know are starting to help you know br bring more kind of credibility and awareness to to teachers and young people around the games industries and everything that surrounds it in terms of you know live streaming um, events management and production marketing branding you know coaching there's 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 other aspects of all of these things that go into screen industries so you know just kind of trying to heighten the the understanding on, around um, the teaching as well, and upskilling, finding teachers that can deliver those those skills to, to young people. Um, I'm sure that Scott's going to have more, I've, you know, more to add to this. I'll I'll stop talking so Scott can weigh in here. Thanks, Joel. Yeah, let's hand over to Scott. Yeah, two things I would like to highlight. Um, the first is the extent to which we are or aren't getting the balance right between the breadth and the depth. So again, Margaret's outlined there, you know, that the scope of the screen industries. So again, are we getting, you know, uh, enough knowledge, understanding uh, across that sort of huge breadth of different roles, different industries, different areas, uh, and balancing that out with, with the depth that's needed, a more robust understanding and that higher level of technical skill. So it's, it's that balance I'd like to highlight. And the second one really is, the extent to which our curriculum, our qualifications, mainly at level three, but also beyond, are or aren't plugging those skills gaps that are obvious to, to everyone uh, who's, who's here, who's working in industry. Thanks very much, Scott. Um, and this this issue of um, the the, evolve, the rapidly evolving technological basis and, and I suppose working patterns of, of jobs in the creative industries is is an interesting one to, to try and think through um, and the skills gaps issue thanks for raising that too wonderful okay so and now I'd like to um, invite Jenny Walker to speak and Jenny um, teaches students at Franklin College in in northeast Lincolnshire so Jenny tell us about things from your perspective hi um, well yeah so I teach on CTEC level two, level three, A-level film studies, basically all the medium film courses here. Um, we've got a real kind of broad mix of students that do our courses. A lot of them do media and film and have very kind of focused career goals. There's a couple of them behind me uh, working on their own personal projects. I've told them to be very quiet. Um, but one of our kind of like key issues that we have in our local area, because I'm in Grimsby, is um, work experience for our students. There is not a lot of opportunities for students in this local area to get experience within any kind of creative industry. Um, and if we do find it, it's very hard to kind of organize just to get somebody in or even on a Zoom call to talk to students and things. Um, and uh, there's a, a kind of a lack of funding as well to support us getting our students to kind of like a little bit further afield um, so that's the biggest issue that we have is, is is actually tapping into that work experience we've got career there are career academies for like business and stem there's a real kind of like push on kind of stem um, and health and social care but 
um, you know, the creative arts, and this isn't just film media, this is like art as well, graphics and all of those kind of things as well, uh, that, that we, we, we need a bit more of that. And, and I think, because that's so, inval it's so valuable, and going back to what you're saying about employability skills as well, it kind of ties in with that. Um, and I think we, with the kind of curriculum and the breadth and depth, I think with some of the courses that we teach, you, you get the opportunity to do the, the breadth and the depth. Like on the CTEC, the, the modules that we choose allow students to get a kind of a real broad range of different jobs within the industry. You know, like not everyone's a director um, and that you could do, like you were saying, kind of project management and things. Um, and we kind of like we structure the course so they they learn about lots of things and then they work towards the kind of final project where they're specializing in a, an area that they want to kind of go into um but yeah our biggest thing is is really that kind of like work experience um and it's, it's really hard to to kind of tap into um we try and create like clients uh, but the clients are usually me and the other kind of teachers creating a kind of company and a business that wants something so they kind of get a, a bit of um experience but it's not as good as a real thing so that's where i'm at okay that's great thanks very much um yeah really fascinating and, and this issue of every student wants to be a director it's, it's something that we talk about we even talk about it um, at, at the level of working with university students it was a topic at, at the connected campus meeting last week as i recall um thanks thanks very much jenny that's really helpful okay um next i'm going to call on um alison from ctvc alison's head of digital content and training and delivers bfi academies to 16 to 18 year olds alison tell us what, what your perspective on this is yeah, great. A lot of the stuff, thanks, James, a lot of the stuff um, that everyone has spoken about is stuff that I was thinking about. And actually, I was going to build on the work experience and job placements, but linking to the um, to the specific job roles. Um, we work with 16 to 19 year olds largely through our BFI Film Academy work. Um, but being a production company as well, we produce TV, radio, radio, digital. Um, there should be a seamless link there with the young people that we're working with and we should be able to seamlessly be finding placements for them within our productions um, but it's so often it's quite difficult because of the quite um, regimented time frames because of their education or um, particularly at the moment I don't need to talk about the restrictions that we have in place um, but more often than not I will go and talk to one of the departments within our company and they will need such a specific skill area or such a specific job role um, that it's sometimes really hard to match the young people that I know quite personally from working with them with the job roles um, or the, the placements or the the work experience even that is there to make sure that it's going to be really valuable so I just think you know to, to echo definitely what everyone has said we really struggle with production secretary with coordinator roles they're the skills that are needed they're the skills that we definitely talk about within our sessions and thank you for the wonderful screen skills website we use the job profiles so much and yet so often young people within I think this age gap 16 to 19 still feel that you know director producer editor dop are the roles for them and for us as a working production company that actively wants to engage with young people we find it incredibly difficult to find placements for those young people within our work and i'm sure many other production companies the same size of us are the same and, and the only other thing i would probably add is mentoring i think some amazing mentoring schemes are in existence and amazing mentoring does take place but to really find mentor relationships that have a longevity and that that allow um you know direct working with young people and really seeing them through those difficult times when they might face rejection when um they might be you know having to have a, a recap or a reminder about some of those employability skills that they need when they go on set or when they join a production company or join a production office i think um that long-term relationship i think can be really valuable and quite often it's really difficult to find that or to to have something that um that really has a sense of longevity rather than a couple of one-off coffees or, or meetups or something like that. That's great. Thanks a lot, Alison. Um, yeah, a couple of messages are starting to uh, sort of come through loud and clear here, um, which is really helpful. Next, I'll hand over um, to Glyn, if that's all right, Glyn. So yeah. Glyn is head of skills and industry engagement at Screen Yorkshire. Over to you, Glyn. Um, hi, James. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it, um, as James indicated, um, it's something that we've discussed. Um, I run the Connect Campus uh, group at uh, Screen Yorkshire, which now has 10 Yorkshire universities and eight uh, Yorkshire colleges. And this is top of our agenda, as James will see at most of the time. And we have uh, Indies and employers coming in all of the time. Um, the message from them um, through me or directly from them uh, is that they don't feel uh, uh, those who are graduating from film and TV and journalism courses are ready. Um, uh, they, and, and I, sorry about the noise, my wife speaks to Saudi Arabia for a moment. Um, but, uh, but apart from, uh, I totally um, uh, empathise with the idea that everyone wants to be a director or a DOP or an editor. That's, that's absolutely true. It, it's a little bit worse than that in a way, um, because the message that I get from most employers um, uh, who we talk to all of the time, and I'm sure Dawn and Adam will underline this, um, is uh, they don't know what their first job is. Um, I, I, it's, po it's very possible that you teach them uh, and they don't turn up uh, or, um, uh, or they turn up and they don't listen. But um, the message is loud and clear from industry that they don't know what they're supposed to be doing for the first six months. Um, they don't know what their roles and responsibilities are. They don't, want the, don't know what the parameters are. Uh, often they're not watching the programs that those um, uh, producers are making. Um, they're, they're watching something completely different if they're, if they're watching TV at all. <laughs> um, and it is very frustrating. There's also the message, I think, that um, that's not got across. Again, it, you, you may be teaching them, but the message um, that I'm hearing is they don't understand a, free li a freelance lifestyle. They understand what that means um, uh, and their parents are behind them saying what in god's name are you going into this for this isn't a job this is you're, you're, you're being employed for six weeks here what's what the hell's going on why don't you be a doctor it's too late now so um there's a lot of different things and one thing that we are focusing on in connect campus also in the bfi skills review that i'm that i'm a part of at the moment much more broadly is whether there's a need for transitional courses um, if they've not got the message um, of what they need to do, what their jobs and roles and responsibilities are, maybe someone else has to teach them um, as a transition into work. Um, because at the moment, to be brutal uh, about it, um, there is a high percentage. Uh, I'm not talking about students who want to go and do other things, uh, who don't want to come into media. I'm not talking about those who want an academic future or are just using it as a, any kind of... I'm talking about those who are knocking on the doors of employers and at the moment a very high proportion um, uh, don't appear to know what it is that they're offering. Thanks very much Glyn. Um, yeah that, that, um, that's almost they don't know what their first job is that is something that's kind of imprinted on my brain at the moment um, as, as an issue to, to, to think through carefully. Um, well, we can we can now move on to um, to Adam, who who is a production manager at AirTV in Yorkshire. Um, so, Adam, what's you, what's your perspective on this? Um, I feel like I might not have that much new to say after everybody else has summed it up very well, including Glenn. Thanks, Glenn. Um, so, a couple of bits. I would echo the the job pathways. Um, Margaret's amazing job skills section of um, Screen skills is really good. I sort of refer to it all the time. Um, I think everybody, sh I direct people to it as well as part of my kind of advice that I send people if they ask for it. Um, and yeah, I've seen Margaret's just said she marks all the entry level roles on there. So if people are kind of actually using that as a resource, then that would be really, really helpful. Um, often interview people who are coming for their sort of first roles or second roles and they tell us they want to be a director of, um, you know, scripted films um, when they're coming for work in a high volume fractal TV company based in Yorkshire. Um, so I think uh, that sort of segues into something that is really missing is, is people's knowledge of the local market, like what companies are based here and what kind of TV we make. So, um, I've been interviewing people for TV jobs for the best part of a decade now. And something I always like to ask them is, what are you watching? What do you enjoy watching? And fair enough, they might sort of, their favorite things might be scripted 
and the big dramas on Netflix. And you can say that by all means, because we like them too, but you need to be able to talk about, even if it's not strictly true, you need to be able to talk about what the company that you're at an interview for is making and evaluate it critically. Obviously not to kind of spectacularly deep level if you're coming for an entry level job, but just to bring a couple of ideas. If I ask you what you like about a show that we make, you should be able to answer that question without too much difficulty. And we've interviewed people at kind of entry-ish and just above recently who just haven't had anything for that question, which was disappointing. Um, and then I guess one other thing, which probably links into the employability skills. So I was really pleased to hear about those, those modules coming online and everyone's thinking about them. So yeah, that just kind of general office etiquette is really good. And something that I've come across in a few places I've worked is we just need people to be confident on the phone, which I think is, potentially a generational thing. Everyone loves to text and message, but a few people are, seem to be more reluctant to pick up the phone and just be able to ring someone and get a quick answer or put them on the spot to sign their consent form, not give them an option to bat it off for a bit. Um, yeah, I think that sums up what I would say. Yep, that's that's really great. Thanks, Adam. Um, so we've got about eight minutes left of, of this first session and we've got three people to deal with and these are all um there are the university of halls uh, they're part of the northern media mentors group so um these people kindly give up their time and they're all media professionals who who have taken on mentorship responsibility for our students so they've got that joint perspective of working in industry and also trying to to guide young people through um their sort of first steps into the career so lambros can i can i call on you first to to say what you think the sort of the recurrent issues are here right well obviously as people can see i'm getting on a bit in life and that now now that i've stepped back from my company i've got more time to do things like mentoring which i've i've personally benefited from in the past and i've got a particular thing with whole university that I, I want to help students from there. And um, I suppose for me, the two reasons I've come into it is one, I think students need to know how the industry works. You know, what's it all about? How, you know, where do you go first? And I suppose the second point is about developing relationships with people in the industry, whether it's with indies or broadcasters or whatever's available. So those are the kind of two key things for me. And, um, I wish I'd known this when I first started my own indie 25 years ago. It's one of those things I fell into because it was a second career and I really hadn't appreciated how important it was to kind of have these relationships. So that, that's how you progress. And people like Dawn who's sitting there, who's helped me a lot when I used to go to all the, the packed conferences around the world with her, and she'd introduced me to people and that one thing led to another. And I think a lot of it particularly if you're just going into the industry is, you know, who are, the, who are the people you're meant to contact? What are the jobs available? And how do, I, how do I develop some of these relationships? So that's what I've tried to do with some of the students I've been mentoring. And as I've, it's interesting because I've now been out of, I've, I've kind of been in semi-retirement for about four years. And during that time, all the contacts I had, obviously they're starting to disappear. And I thought, well, if I'm going to carry on doing this, I need to I need to work with more people like me who are a lot younger than me. And there's there's two already here. And uh, as a group, we've started to try and make contacts for students who want to go out into the world, of, in, into the industry world. So that's kind of where we're at. And um, I'm I'm really pleased there's help in the region because because we're all we've all got a connection to Hull. We tend to work quite a lot with that region. But, you know, I think this is the first time that I've started to connect with people in that region. And I think as a group, that's something we need to do a lot more of if we're going to be able to help these students in terms of progressing in their careers. Thank you, Lambros. That's really helpful. Can I now invite um, Dawn to speak? So Dawn is Managing Director of Business Development and Global Strategy at PACT, which for anyone who doesn't know is the UK screen sector trade body. Hi. Um, yeah, I think most people will be aware who we are, either the members or in Glyn's case, a past member. <laughs> um, and, and obviously Screen Skills will we'll know as well. Uh, it is interesting just listening because it feels like I've been saying all of this for years 
um, and you know about not fit for purpose. And our members, one of the biggest biggest complaints about media students is, you know, we have to we have to. Oh, sorry, technical problems. Um, that we have to almost like start again with them, um, and often they'll choose not to hire people from a media degree because they come with too many bad habits and too too high in expectation because they'll come in and they'll want to be a producer director because that's what they've trained to do um, and that takes years and I think not wanting to squash their ambition it's about being able to give them the skills that is needed right now that can open those doors and can be their their first job and that's why we started developing uh, the, the screen, the skills module, um, the platform that, that we have that Paul University are gonna be um, using next year. Um, and, and that was based, you know, we had over 300 production companies sign up to this to want to contribute to uh, feeding in to the things that they feel are the skills gaps that's missing in their, their industry. And, and I think students often, they have two, two routes. One is, you know, they want to be a producer, director, they want to be a camera operator. And I think, you know, but there's a lack of knowledge. And I think somebody mentioned about what is a freelancer and what does that mean? You know, you're basically running a business. So where are all the business skills that you've had? Because you're managing your own company, you're promoting yourself, you've got to be a marketeer, you've got to be a salesperson, you've got to be very good at your job because you're only hired on the back of your last project um, and then going out into a freelance world with no credits with no experience you know it's a really really tough world so what we're saying is there's lots of jobs Margaret picked up on it they've got job I mean I've looked at there and there's hundreds of jobs all the time but never do they really say a producer director occasionally you'll get that but mostly it's everything underneath and I think there isn't there isn't I, I don't know what's happening or where it's breaking down, but people, the students seem to be going through that process of just being um, a producer or director or something at very, very high end. Um, and I see, I see when, people, when students leave university, there's three routes if they want to work in the industry. Um, you've got the freelance, which we know is, is very tough. If, you, if you're starting from scratch and you've got no credits. So it's very, very much hand to mouth existence until you can build up that reputation. You can start a company, but starting a, a, an indie yourself and starting a production company, um, again, it's very difficult if you haven't already got people that you're hiring with credits that can open doors with broadcasters and going back to, you really need the business skills. So you've got two areas where you, you know, business skills starts to shine through. And then you've got, which is probably where majority of the, the full-time jobs come, which is in the ind independent sector. You know, if you think about the broadcasters, we've only really got a handful of broadcasters. You know, very few do in-house production anymore. Um, and most of them are probably lifers that have been there, there forever. So there's very few jobs, even in the broadcasters and indies, that are necessarily produce director. It's all of the other skills. So the skills gaps that our members are, um, are always raising are things like, um, made a note here, uh, commercial, you know, understanding secondary rights, how to structure co-production deals, business affairs, production management. You know, it's all of those skills that feel that they might be covered at university, but not enough for people to have the confidence to feel that they can apply for those jobs if they if they saw them. That's great. Thanks, Dawn. Feel, feel I like a, time, so I won't say too much more. Yeah, feels like a clear picture is emerging. So, um, Steve, over to you. Um, what would you like to add? Um, well, I know time is short, and I'm the, am I the last one to speak? So, um, I'll try and find something that nobody has mentioned and actually it's what I was going to introduce at the very beginning so having been an exec producer in the BBC in a number of independents in factual uh, specialist factual in particular I think the two areas that 
students or even anybody coming into the industry are, are kind of ill prepared for is research and writing. And I think it just cuts down to the key school, core skills that you need within this industry. It's a storytelling industry, whether you're doing games, drama, however you're doing it, it's story, story, story. And where I find lots of the students, and again, we've recruited many into the BBC, into the big Indies, fall short is research. You know, Google is not the way to find the new exciting breakthrough stories they're going to make your documentary or maybe even your drama i mean lots of these factual ideas drift into creating the new the new dramas but you've got to find ways of digging out those stories and i think it comes down to the soft skills which is the ability to talk to people um, i did a program recently about graphene and three researchers very they said skilled researchers gave me all the stories that i'd already seen on Google. You have to get into the universities. You've got to go and talk in the bars and the pubs with whoever's working on something. And do they know that Frankie is working on this really weird thing that nobody's talking about? You just need to find the stories. And, and that's what I've always found really exciting about this business. That's why we have the luxury of exploring stories and people. So that's the bit I would say it just comes down to the very basics, research and writing, yeah. Thanks, yeah. It, it, it's good to hear that, that balance of hearing people say graduates don't have the skills we need, but also the soft skills are kind of the, the central gateway to so many things as well, which is an interesting pair of propositions to, to balance. Um, thank you to all of our panellists. Um, John... John Swords has, has um, asked to to make a, a comment um, on the bit on the back of some things that have been said here. Over to you, John. I just want to offer a bit of a slightly alternative perspective. So I'm not in the industry, but there's a lot of research with people in the industry as people to take that. And I think the point about awareness is a really interesting one. And I think it's about jobs in the industry. And I think it's also important that when we're training or educating people to go into industry, they are aware of what it's like working in there. I think what isn't clear to a lot of people is how long the hours are, the level of precarity in the industry, the level of discrimination and exclusion and exploitation that a lot of people um, face in the industry. Um, the recruitment processes um, aren't like other parts of the economy. And I think it's really it's, it's inherent on us you know, producing or helping the students go through our courses to work in so that they're aware of those sorts of conditions and that we don't just equip them with the skills to make film, TV, computer games, etc. But we also equip them to be able to cope um, with the sorts of conditions that they might face or that they experience. Yeah, I would agree. And and to make an informed decision about about what they're signing up for, I guess. Um, a few people have mentioned sort of the freelancing as as one of the realities of of the industry and that is difficult um yeah especially if you don't have the um sort of the safety net um that would allow you to sort of start a freelance career um yeah thank you for that john okay um we're slightly over time but thankfully we had the the foresight to make our break times reasonably um lengthy so I'll invite everyone. Um, thank you again to all of our, our panelists. That's a really great set of, of ideas for us to, to think about for the rest of today. Um, I encourage you um, not to check your email and to take a break from your screen so we can all come back at three o'clock uh, moderately refreshed if possible. So yeah, I'm gonna uh, mute and turn off my video and walk away from my screen um, and we'll see everyone back here at three o'clock for the next session. Thanks very much. Great, we'll crack on then. Um, so yeah, so building on that first session where we've got a range of different um, skills, um, gaps and skill shortages and issues kind of identified um, from all the different panelists. What we're gonna try and do in this session is kind of drill down a little further um, and address the question, what should be our collective focus when providing skills training and guidance for young people um, looking to enter the screen industries? Um, so I think we can pick up on a number of the different uh, themes which emerged in the first um, in the first session, and I've scribbled down, I think, most of those. Um, so people raised the issue of awareness of roles 
um, that young people could potentially go into. And I guess connected to that is also the career paths they can take um, from those different entry roles. Um, this idea of kind of everyday skills that people are required to just kind of work, whether it be time management, um, telephone skills, um, research type skills, just being able to talk to people and work alongside people. Um, there's a set of uh, financial and monetary skills related to the kind of employment that goes with working in the screen industry, particularly freelancing. There's um, networking skills and the need to build networks. Um, I think also a theme which wasn't explicit, but also the need to be adaptable um, and adaptive to different situations, um, whether that's the kind of programming that you're making or the kind of role that you're working in. Um, there's also an awareness of commercial and legal issues. Um, and also kind of the idea to kind of go beyond the Google and to kind of delve into kind of bigger issues. I think those are some of the things that we can pick up um, in the smaller groups that we're going to break out into now. Um, so we'll have about 25 minutes to discuss some of these issues. Um, we've got some jam boards uh, to make notes on if groups want to use those. And um, those have been linked to in the chat. Um, there's different ones for different groups. Um, and what we'll do is we'll come back after about 25 minutes or so and kind of feedback and have a bit of a plenary to discuss and maybe highlight what are those key issues. Um, that topic question is in the structure and is also on the Jamboard titles, but just to repeat it, it's what should be our collective focus when providing skills, training and guidance for young people looking to enter the screen industries. Um, we have pre-allocated people into breakout rooms. Um, some might be rather small. If you're if you find yourself in a in a breakout room with just one other person, either embrace that um, or come back into the main room. And um, if James or Harriet can hang around, so we can maybe reallocate people. Um, but yeah, James or Harriet, if you could hit the button, and we should all disappear into our own separate room. Excellent. So I think we're going to be a small group. Hi guys. Hello. It's sufficient um, to be to form a group. I think if it was just two of us, we might have to reallocate. Um, cool. So, I mean, obviously, you, you two have already contributed um, to the panel. Are there particular key things you think that you would like um, graduates or students at whatever level to kind of, if there's one thing you could pick? What do you think would be the most crucial thing for the country from your perspectives? Ah, that's hey, hard. Man. One thing. Sorry, Joe, go on. I was just gonna say, say, can you say that again, John? Just to just reiterate that question. Sorry. I was wondering if there was a, I mean, as as Adam has just said, it's quite hard to pick one single thing. But you know, if there was like what, what should the core focus be on, do you think, to kind of help people get into careers and progress careers in the screen industries? I suppose I might say I'll probably be cheating by making it quite a broad thing but I think for people to have that understanding of the roles that are open to them and sort of demonstrate the knowledge of how the industry works like the business part of it like there's all these deals happening and the way that you're going to get paid is because a broadcaster has decided there's a gap in the schedule for this type of program and so this company that's employing you has spent time, money, effort, creativity on pitching an idea to the point where they've decided they're going to spend a significant sum of their money on it, um, where the broadcaster's money comes from. So the difference between how the BBC is funded and the commercial broadcasters are funded, and even the differences between the different types of commercial broadcasters and indeed like streamers and stuff, you know, subscription, um the advertising that you're selling on discovery and uk tv channels is not going to be the same as the type of money that itv gets and channel four and channel five are somewhere in between just i mean that kind of, that's kind of i've sort of built that up myself from being in roles but that i didn't ever like get taught that i don't think i remember having i did a media degree i remember having a module by a, a slightly disaffected bbc producer who's sort of I'm sure she taught me a few things, I can remember them, but I have an impression that she sort of complained about it a bit and how like things went horribly wrong there and that's why she left rather than 
perhaps using that whole module rather than focusing on the specifics of the BBC and stuff, because that's what she knew about. It would perhaps have been more useful to bring in just a wider industry type. Mm. This was a long time ago. Things have probably improved, but it, yeah, that could have been an opportunity really to just give that really broad knowledge that w when people come to us and sp speak and kind of obviously grasp that, it just makes a really good impression that they've taken the time to understand, even if it's just how our little bit of it works and how we fit in. Mm. And it, it gives them a head start, doesn't it? And you don't yeah. have to explain to them that background. They can automatically see where you fit in, so they can just start making, start making the programming. Mm. Mm. Joel, does that kind of fit? Is that easy to translate into into curricula? No, not at all. <laughs> I think it's that's exactly what I've been thinking while you've been talking here. And I mean, I'm I'm obviously um, I've been asked to kind of attend um, from an educational point of view. But however, I'm here from a research point of view myself because, you know, always trying to to learn how best to um, formulate these kinds of things into taught curriculum that teachers can grasp and deliver effectively. And, you know, some of the stuff that was said in the previous session around access to work placements and actual people who work in industry even coming giving like a, you know, a, um, a talk like this, you know, just to, to talk to students about the realities of working in the industry and what it takes what what you should expect you know um, in terms of starting out as a runner or whatever it is you you know a production assistant and moving up from that and how you can prepare yourself to get the foot in the door how, who you have to speak to what you have to know um, all those things are kind of life lessons and they're hard to put into curriculum and they're also evolving you know things seem to change quite quickly and for different yeah. parts different aspects of the industry have different things. Every time I talk to people from the games industry, they, you know, some of the, some of the key advice that comes through is people have to understand coding and, you know, um, and visual um, development, and they have to understand how they work together. Even if you only work on the coding side of it, you have to understand, you have to communicate with these kinds of people. If you, if you come in for an interview and you don't understand that you're, you're not going to get the job over somebody who does, um, you know, just there's certain key, you know, also um, worked with somebody um, in Nottingham who was running one of the BFI Academy um, courses and his main piece of advice and pardon the French, but he said, don't be a dick. He said, if you, if you are, if you don't show up on time or you're difficult to work with and you don't have a driver's license and you, you know, he's like, you're not going to make it. You need to, there are certain things you have to understand about working with people and working as part of a team. And they're not the kinds of things you put into teaching curriculum for 14 to 16 year olds, you know, or 16, 18 year olds. Um, they're the kinds of things that you try to, to hopefully glean, you know, pass on to, to teachers in these kinds of forms, I suppose, to make sure that mm. they're, they're feeding it through, but also that, you know, that screen skills um, kind of library of information is all really, really useful because you get the video clips of people like you, Adam, speaking about their experience, talking about, how do they get into the industry? And what I always find fascinating is how many different variations everybody finds their own way. I I went through art school um, and uh, you know in fine art and illustration, graphics. I did some graphics work and stuff like that. But the only module I had was at the end of my four year degree. I took it in America. I had I had a half a semester of getting work. Basically, it was like freelancing. You know, it's like how are you going to get get a job now that you got all these skills you know and it was it was probably the most eye-opening thing and it was also the, the most scary thing because I start, suddenly realized I didn't know how I was going to get a job or what I was going to you know what was out there for me you know and and I still don't <laughs> it's like part of part of me is the reason why I do what I do is because I went in a you know everybody takes these all their own strange paths to get to where they are so there's not right one right or wrong way it's about I think if there's, you know, in answer to your question, John, if there's one thing that could kind of be passed on or one key sort of piece of information, I think it would be, um, I think have the skills and be confident in the skills, but also you have to be able to network. You have to be able to um, put yourself out there. I think letting people find you and making sure that you're finding ways to connect to other people to show that you're there and you're working and that you're looking for, for work is the only way to 
to start things start things moving you know to, to get yourself in there and once you're in there i think you start to find your own path i think it's getting the foot in the door it's you kind of need a module in getting started you know getting your foot in your first start in the industry is kind of what we need a module on mm -hmm. like a master class in different ways of doing that what does it take for different industries it takes different things going back to games it was like um they're looking for very specific things so you have to have you know for vfx you've got to have this very specific focus on certain programs certain types of visual effects you know you know or else they're doing infographics or you know whatever they're they're producing very specific things and there's specialists in each part and they're looking for those those people who specialize other parts of the industries you need more well-rounded people who can kind of drift from one um, aspect of filmmaking to another for example so different industries different parts of the screen industries have different requirements and that's the hard thing to get across as well so you know that's what i'm trying to, to gather and, and pass on mm. and i wonder i wonder if you could kind of share with how you got your foot in the door um in the industry and has would that method still work today do you think you're talking to adam because i'm yeah. i don't really work Probably in the screen adam. industry yeah. yeah okay so i yeah everyone's will be weird but mine is it's not that weird it's so i graduated from my course um in is that, that a media course it was a media degree at uh royal holloway university of london um mixture of uh academic and practical work um it was media arts and i kind of was young and passionate about arty stuff so i focused a fair bit on the arts and probably didn't do as many of the practical modules as i could have done um and I got a 2-2. Two -two. I was quite disappointed, but looking back, that is all I deserved for the effort that I put in. Absolutely. It was completely fair. Um, so kind of after feeling a little bit niffed about that for a bit, I started like look, looking. So I found an advert in the back of a magazine, a physical careers magazine uh, for a job at the BBC in the subtitling department. And I applied for it and I got it. And I, I can't imagine that would happen today in fact I know it wouldn't because there's no magazines and to get a permanent contract at the BBC straight away is just like not a thing anymore um to be fair I think I've got 12 months to begin with but it soon turned into a permanent contract um and then my path did exactly as you were saying Joe it kind of went like all over the place so I spent four years in that department in subtitling which was part of broadcasting and presentation so it, it, it does underline actually some of the stuff that was said before that I had no idea that that department even existed until I saw the advert in the magazine. Um, you sort of kind of get a little bit um, pigeonholed, but quite focused on, you know, the research camera producer director and everybody wants to be a director as we've discussed that's kind of born out in fact from doing hundreds of interviews myself. Um, and then so I sort of moved up within that department. So there's this like this whole section that's now contracted out to Red B, but doing access services, um, the people who play out the programs, um, the guys who plan the trails between the programs for BBC media planning, um, all that massive multi-million pound business that just didn't know about was the thing. Lots of people who I started out with then are kind of still there. They've made really great careers in that in that department. Um ended up moving up north I left left screen industries briefly and went and worked in a newspaper it wasn't for me and I came back to work at Look North in Hull on the basically the rotors for everybody there like scheduling the reporters when they were working looking after their holidays and who was doing what that kind of thing so that's kind of how I got my foot back in the door of the BBC but I only got that because I'd already done the first job. I think if I'd have come to that sort of blind and been able to transfer a few of the skills from that first job into that one, that kind of wouldn't have worked out for me. Um, and then I went, I did that for about four years. Then I went and did the same job, but for BBC Sport in Manchester when that moved up north. Um, and then there's only so many years of doing the rotor that you can take before it drives you insane. Uh, so I discovered that there was this other role that I hadn't come across before working there called a talent manager, which is basically recruitment for TV people. If you haven't come across it before, a fancy word for that. But it kind of it is quite niche in that you've heard how fussy everybody is for the skills that we're looking for. So it's kind of maintaining all those networks of people, um, 
and listening to kind of briefs for commissions and suggesting people with the right experience. And so there's kind of everything from, oh my God, we need another AP to start on Monday. Can you find someone? And calling around on a Friday afternoon to try and make that happen to formal BBC interview processes, which take months and involve poor people coming in for whole days of assessments and grillings by five people asking them very serious questions. Um, and so, yeah, I did that for a couple of BBC departments. Then I decided I had enough BBC, uh, left and joined a really small talent agency that did kind of really similar work, but for lots of different indies. Um, and that went, then COVID happened. So, cause that was a tiny business, they kind of wound right down cause production stopping. Nobody really needed any new staff for a bit. So unfortunately they had to let me go. But at that point I called upon like all my old contacts from previously so kind of my talent manager stuff came in really handy and I just happened to come across air tv who were looking for somebody to backfill from someone on a career break um so I joined in quite a junior my job title hasn't changed but in terms of my responsibilities I joined sort of fairly low but I've sort of gone up to semi proper production manager duties now a year on and kind of I'm like super happy here and I'm on a new career path to hopefully you know move up on this path for for a while so that's my like crazy journey but it's all been built on all the recent stuff anyway is keeping up those relationships and the networking and just knowing so if I hadn't kind of done that myself and it's just been sort of this BBC lifer in a different type of role and built up those skills because I was the one doing the hiring I wouldn't have known necessarily that I had to basically email all my contracts with a nice, hey, how are you doing? I've recently done this, I'm come available, can we have a catch up? And because of that, because of knowing that that's what I had to do, I was really lucky and I think I was only out of work for two days in the end, which was amazing. Yeah, that, that's impressive for someone working in TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got, I got really lucky. I, I also was about to start work as a Morrison's delivery driver. Yeah, I, went, I went for the induction and then uh, my boss my new boss called me the next day and said uh, do you want to come here instead I was like, go on then <laughs> came to <Yeah>. save you <laughs> yes yes yeah, that, that, that's really interesting that kind of circuitous route yeah, route. You, you yeah. Kind of, you've put down to luck but I presume it wasn't luck entirely well, you worked hard and you've made those networks and yeah yeah and I, I wonder as part of that do you look back on your degree and think Oh, actually, that thing that I did there, it wasn't exactly what I'm doing now, but there was a skill set which I picked up, which can be applied in a different space. Um, I'm reluctant to be too down on my degree because it was like the best time of my life, one of them anyway. But for me, if I'm being brutally honest, a lot of it was kind of about the social aspect of being there and kind of the connections I made that way. Like I made friends for life, a lot of them who do work in the media and I now ring them up and ask them questions for, you know, things that, uh, uh, so yeah, I'm looking for a cameraman with sports experience. I ring my mate who's the golf producer at IMG in London. Um, I've got a friend who's in, like sort of doing very well in BBC News. So anything journalistic, I can go to them. There's, kind of, there's those connections that I made. In terms of the course, I guess, I don't know, a lot, there was some fun academic study of film. It's probably, it's more down to the modules that I chose and what I put into it, I would say. It's not, it's nothing to do with the teaching. The opportunity was there if I'd have wanted it to take a lot more out of it than I did. And that's kind of like what I say to students now, if I get the choice, just use that kind of time and freedom from the pressure of having a job if you don't have to have a job or if you do have to have a job try and make it something useful and relevant which is what I was going to mention actually I hope you don't mind this little aside but in terms of people getting work experience if there's no work experience within creative or screen industries available for people then I always look really favorably on anything public facing like a hospitality job or a retail job just to be able to demonstrate the stuff that I think I can't remember, Joel, if it was you saying, but someone was saying earlier about like turning up on time and just being able to deal with the public, uh, taking a small bit of responsibility, like for cash or whatever, being presentable, that kind of thing is just a good look, a strong look for 
your CV. So we've seen, again, I hark back to the small recruitment we did a few months ago. Like there was a couple of people who just didn't have any of that. So mm-hmm. not that it's kind of, I mean, if I look at my own kids, I wouldn't necessarily want them to have to have a job while they're studying at uni. If they do do that, I would love for them to have the freedom to make the most of their study time. But at the same time, not having any, not having had any sort of job means you just there was kind of a level of maturity that was noticeable in the people who had had some work than one chap in particular who obviously had the means not to have had to work and he just he basically just didn't know anything about the industry he definitely didn't know what his first job was because he was basically asking us like what do I do now um so it, it was just really interesting to see that and he'd only done the things that his course had asked him to do rather than anything additional, which is what makes you stand out these days. Yeah, I can certainly recognise that from the other side. For the students that I've taught who have been the most organised, it's the ones that have other commitments, whether that's playing for one of the university sports teams or having a job. They have to have good time management. They have to be organised enough to do that thing at this period because there's no other point that they can do it. And then I think a lot of them don't realise how important that is for having a job um that, that that sort of skill um that's really Richard and going back to one of the earlier things we were talking about I wonder whether there's there's this perception that educators aren't producing the right kinds of workers and I wonder whether there's a mismatch between the way in which teaching happens in the UK and the way in which the screen industries works there's so much learning on the job um Adam, you were saying that you came to understand kind of different business models by kind of piecing it together and kind of learning things. Whereas what we teach at university or what's on the curriculum at school is all it's all codified and it's written down. You can put it in a textbook and a teacher can deliver it. It's not learning by doing. It's kind of it's learning by reading and being taught. Do you think do you think there's something in that? Yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, as you guys were speaking before, I I was thinking that it's there's obviously a balance between what you are just going to have to learn on the job because some of it just is that that's, there's no getting away from it. But I think there probably is a bit more that you can do with that way of teaching to sort of brief people about the types of things to be thinking about, like how, how it had just what I was going saying earlier, like how, how has this come about this whole industry that, people are exchanging money for us to be able to have these really fun jobs and make amazing content that wins awards. Um, there's, it, you've just got to be aware of that commercial aspect to it, which I definitely wasn't for ages. I was just like, oh yeah, my, my role is funded by the license fee and I don't need to think about any of that until I started working for BBC Studios and suddenly it was like, if we don't get any more commissions, we're all out of the job. <laughs> Um, it's sort of it's a quick that was a quick learning curve to sort of work all that out um so yeah you're asking more about like how is that taught and is there a mismatch it's that first again sort of slightly reluctant to be too down on the courses and teaching because everyone's clearly like doing their best but um i think potentially there is. I mean, I don't know if teachers are kind of giving that honest appraisal of how it works and what your first job will be. And again, it's like a balance of not wanting to crush people's ambitions. Of I think like Dawn was saying that. I totally want people to be ambitious. And for if you want to be a director, then amazing. That should totally be your ultimate goal. But have the awareness of that path. Mm-hmm. Just because you've pro- produced or directed something at student level you aren't that you're still going to be a runner for your first job and just be aware of that and don't be in a rush as well to work through the roles there's a, there's something this is a bit more industry specific but because of the certain shortages in certain roles and the, the, that growth in the in the yorkshire industry has kind of occasionally meant that people are getting promoted a bit quickly so they still yeah. have gaps and some people see their friends getting promoted because they're like oh I want to do that but it's it does take a bit of time to sort of become that fully rounded role before you should move up 
So occasionally that can sort of be problematic and people are in a bit of a rush and think, oh, I've been a runner for a six months. I should totally be a researcher now. I've been a researcher for a year. I want to be an AP. It's a bit, okay, just get really good at this job before you start worrying about, about um, the next move. Um, I've been guilty of that myself, absolutely. But again, I wonder if that's maybe something that can be emphasized like it's going to take time to get to where you want to be and it's like fun to get really good at your own job so you're the subject matter expert and people come to you and respect you that will all enhance your kind of reputation as part of this networking like oh yeah so and so is an amazing researcher we should get them in and then inevitably they'll find themselves there when the project gets recommissioned and there's an ap role on it because someone will go oh do you want to be the ap on this and then that's your chance rather than like really pushing for it before you're ready. Mm. Sure. It's interesting. Some of, the, so, some of the stuff you said, Adam, um, is really interesting because um, some of what we have to do from, from my perspective is combat the idea that taking, well, I, I look after BTEC, so I, I look after the vocational education side of things. I don't look at, I used to look after A-levels and GCSEs in art, design, creative media, drama, performing arts, um, all kinds of stuff that um, comes into the screen, you know, feeds into the screen industries. Um, but media studies, like A-level media studies, I don't, I'm no, no longer involved in. I'm looking at media production. Um, so technical and practical kind of side of things. And they are very much about coming in and doing. The content in the curriculum is quite light. It's quite high level because we, because it's down to the teacher's experience to be able to convey that and allow this, the space and the scope for learners, we call them, we call them learners in BTEC students, to um, be able to explore ideas and find their feet and find what they're good at and find what they're interested in and find a passion for something um, and explore it in different media, different forms, um, and then move on. Um, but what we have to combat some quite often from government when they start to look at fun, cutting funds to the arts, which they do every five to 10 years, it seems, um, is the, the idea that it takes a long time. And that this, this is supporting what you said. It takes time and it, to, to build yourself up as a practitioner, a creative practitioner, and to actually have the experience to be well-rounded and to gain the respect that you deserve in the, in the industry. To be taken seriously um, is not, you know, just a kid with some crazy ideas that just can be executed quite poorly. You know, um, you've got to go through the, you've got to go through the, the system almost. You've got to go up. You got to, you got to work your way up, and that means returns on investment in terms of education in university come later in the creative industries than they do in others. You know, they come. It takes more time. Sometimes you never. Um, you never quite achieve the status or the, the money, you know, the, the income that you would expect in other industries. So therefore the government says, why should we support creating a lot of creators when they don't make a return on investment? However, they do provide the industry with, um, I mean, they, they provide the, the, um, the economy with billions of pounds and we're respect around the world for, for the quality of, um, content that gets produced from the UK. So, but what doesn't get talked about very often is the job satisfaction and the, what you said, it, it's fun. Somebody's paying us, even if it's pennies, somebody's paying us to come up with ideas and execute them and make them come to life, you know, and it's, and it's people in this industry are passionate um, and they, and they want to be doing it. They feel like rock stars because they're doing the job that they set out to do, whether it's, you know, being paid really well or not very well at all. Uh, I know the breakout room is about to end, so I'll just try to wrap it up. But anyway, I think that's one of the things that we need to also convey is that don't worry about go, you know, taking your time to move through it. If you can get yourself in the door and you've got a job, you should be happy because you're going to be, you know, you'll be working with creatives and you'll be able to event, find your way into the job that, that suits you within the industry. And there, there will be places, you know, and the industry is big and expansive and you can go, you can move around it. You just have to have those right, those skills. So anyway, that's, that's my two cents on it. 
Yeah, just, just quickly, our vice chancellor loves the latest stats on employability because our English graduates have got some of the best employability scores. And it's the kind of thing that the government doesn't want. But anyway, yeah. we should head back now. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. Hopefully you all had some uh, interesting discussions within your group. So we're just kind of, we'll go around now and kind of report back um, key themes um, that started to emerge. Um, so let's start with Laura, let's start with your group. Any, any, what was the key messages that came out from yours? Uh, okay, um, so I'm just gonna summarize and if anyone, uh, if I've remembered it wrong, uh, chip in please. Um, so we we picked up on uh, some of the things that um, Lambros and Margaret particularly said in their plenary bit. Uh, so uh, we talked about how we could address those issues. Um, so the first thing was uh, thinking about actually uh, where there are kind of skills shortages, thinking about the issue with roles and actually people's understanding of roles beyond the director, as Margaret pointed out, um, perhaps there is value in identifying shortage areas. For example, apparently there are not many production coordinators or production accountants. Um, and uh, perhaps identifying those areas and encouraging students to go into an area which has a shortage and then once they are in, because often it's about getting in, then maneuvering into um, the career path they want. So I encourage that expectation. Um, secondly, we also talked about um, the idea of confidence. So I drew on my experience of teaching students at the University of York versus teaching students at the University of Hull um, and said, well, you know, at Hull, there's a real, there seems to be quite like a, a, a confidence deficit almost. A difference in the way that um, people who don't have a background in industry are, are willing to kind of go up to people and say hello and form networks. So there was, we talked about the idea of maybe how do we do this? Do we, um, and Christina said they hold you know, mock interviews and things. Building in those kind of communication skills is so important, but also demystifying industry. So Lambros mentioned meeting a student, a mentee at BAFTA, and the student was so timid because it was so scary, this kind of big organization. The idea is that we make these we make people look human, we demystify it. We say it's actually not that that scary. <laughs> we kind of try and break it down. Um, and uh, yeah, being realistic about where the work is and how you get into it was also Margaret's point. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that was kind of, the, those were the things that we covered. If I've missed anything, do chip in uh, rest of the group. Basically, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I think, I think we talked about relationships and obviously getting work experience and how, how we might be able to help students do that. You know, I think that's the only other thing that we probably talked about. And some of us who were in the industry, it's something I could do easily a few years ago where I could just ring up my contacts and see if I could arrange it. Indeed, in the past, I've asked all to help me to do it, see if we can get students' workplace, which is some of the connections that we've got. So that was just... That in my own limited way, that's how I've tried to do it. But now our group is bigger. We, we try to do more and more of that, particularly for those people that might be cut off in the region, maybe like Hull, that don't have that kind of access. That's yeah. the only thing I've had. I think that's something that we've been very conscious of when thinking about development of the Yorkshire and Humber region, is that it's, it's not just Leeds, and actually it's quite a big place. Yeah. It's a population of Scotland. If you live in Scarborough, or you live in Hull, it's quite difficult to get to urban urbans, other urban centres. Great stuff. Um, Laura, did you want to come back in there? I saw you on these. Oh, no, I just, I forgot to mention that Christina made a really excellent point about, um, Lambro said that passion for TV is one thing employers look for in young people. And then Christina said, well, young people don't watch telly. They have a very limited and specific uh, things that they watch and a lot of it doesn't include broadcast telly so how do we address that and that's a good point I think to raise we should address that so that's yeah. I'm done <laughs> and I think if you could answer that question the BBC would like to hear from you <laughs> um, fantastic so we'll go uh, to James Ed's groups now yep um, so what what we ended up focusing on was um, we were thinking about um, sort of 16 to 18 education we were talking about work experience opportunities and how 
these are obviously differently distributed across um, the UK and most young people have got very they travel not very far at all to access their um, sort of pre-university education uh, so that can have the effect of exacerbating inequalities and yeah sort of leaving a potential gap uh, that that calls out to be filled in a uh, a media education um, sort of qualification or or even even a short course um, because we had we had Scott from Pearson in our, our session we were talking as well about the implications of the T levels um, which are calling for a larger amount of work experience um, as part of, of what that qualification entails and how that has the potential to to exacerbate regional inequalities. Um, we were mainly focusing on on sort of the issue without yet having a clear idea about how you might start to address it but we we did mention finding ways to incentivize um, media companies to to engage with um, pre-university learners or having some kind of infrastructure in place that would facilitate this but it's um it's a tall order i'm not saying none of it happens but you know it, it's it's not um it remains a problem work experience is not evenly distributed uh, across the uk in the creative industries that that was the main thing that we we focused on uh, James, can I, can I just add something there? Uh, interestingly enough, I mentioned Dawn helping me in the past to get work experience. And one of the things Dawn said to me was, there's a whole insurance problem about, you know, you know, a youngster going into a media company. The media company's got to have the appropriate insurance in place. And that usually scuppered things, did it not, Dawn? Yeah, and also there's a um, there's there's an issue with the, with the payment as well, because everyone has to be paid for the work because otherwise it's, you know, we're going back to um, modern day slavery. If we expect people to come in and do work experience and not get paid. So there's, there has been a, a big call that no one gets anyone to do any work for free. Um, so that, so obviously then that cuts in on budget, bringing somebody in, there's a bit more of a, a commitment commitment there as well as like you say that they have to be set in standards and you know things that they have to do they can't just bring somebody in and sit in the back I know it used to happen years ago but I think we're trying to raise that standard and I think you know we're also you know saying that the the production sector should be should be embracing the fact that we don't support um, modern day slavery that we will pay somebody for doing a job because every job has a value. And if you don't pay somebody for that job, then they feel that they, they you know, there is no, no value to it. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's partly budget, part, and that's only maybe a small bit, but it's the time it takes that you've got to spend and structure that work experience. And, and that is, you know, it still relates to the budget because people's time is, is quite heavy. And, and as anyone knows in, in the indie sector, everyone's running around like a headless chicken 24 hours a day, not knowing where, the, where they can catch the breath, then suddenly having to try and, you know, pass down skills and, um, and have some kind of structured learning. It, it is quite hard because everyone's running quite streamlined really. Dawn, do you know what, can I just say one other thing in response to that? Dawn, you know what would help this? If, say, if Channel 4 decided, like we used to have the packed levies, remember, you'd give 1% of your production fee to for yeah. the, the indie le levy. If there was a line in the Channel 4 budget that said, you know, it's something about training for you know, young people to get into the industry, whatever the line might be, and that was in the budget and Channel 4 accepted it, that would soon sort it out. Yeah, but if, there's, if already, there's already levies that skill set, um, screen skills, right. skill set, screen skills uh, manage. So there is levies that are already taken from production budgets into skills to address the skills gap. And maybe Margaret can maybe yeah. say a little bit more yeah, about that. We have, um, there's a high-end television skills fund. That's an unscripted television skills fund um, that we administer, an animation fund, um, and um, 
I'm missing one, film skills funds. So we've got these skills funds and we administer them and, um, and we have councils that decide how that money is spent. And some of that money is spent, most of that money is spent on training, uh, but it's driven by industry skills shortages, obviously, um, a lot yeah. of the time. Um, and that's where most of the money comes from for us to do all the things I've been talking about. So well, I, suppose, I suppose the point I'm making though, Margaret, is that, you know, when I was running Glasshead, you know, because I don't see where that money goes, I don't have the same commitment to bring some youngster in and get them to go out with the with the crew or whatever it might be. Yeah. Whereas if I knew I was paying, I don't know, X hundred quid towards that, I'd make sure I had someone in my company that was doing that job. Well, that's kind of exactly what we do. So we've got councils of industry from all the companies. I mean, on the unscripted fund, we've got BBC, we've got ITV, we've got Sky, we've got mm. Channel 4, and they they pay in the money and decide how we spend it. So that kind of already happens, but yeah. I suppose I'm saying, let's encourage the owners of these indies as well to put more into it. And I'm saying if I could mm. if I could manage yeah, a bit of that. I, yeah, I think I mean I think the passion is there, but what you've got to also think with my indie hat on is budgets are extremely, yeah. extremely tight. You know, yeah. heightened because of COVID, you know, that's yeah. added 15, 20 mm percent -hmm. on, on budgets anyway. No one gets fully funded anymore. So you're you're working in deficit finance, paying out more on budget, trying to find the gap. Uh, gap finance so I think you know it, I, I think the passion and willingness is there I just think rather than paying more and more levies is there another way that we can do this is there a structured way and and, and maybe that's more about industry being part of of that skills training in a different way not necessarily through a, a, a levy because I, I I get what you're saying Lambros you don't you think what am I paying it for we don't benefit and we've had that um, Margaret will probably know that that has been said people go well I have to pay this money but we don't get any benefit and and you'll always have that because some are able to take more advantage than others so I just think there's another way than than keep adding more and more more levies um, just to just, just say about visits as well and um, we had some funding for a creative careers program which we did across the creative industries uh, and in November 2019, before lockdown, we had to do an online week last year. We we did a, um, a creative careers week and we took 40,000 children out of school all across the UK. And we we took them to studios and animation studios and museums and makers and all of that sort of thing. And it was a massive organisation. But a lot of the companies, 94.7% of the companies in the creative industries are 10 people or less. They can't accommodate a class that's part of your problem as well. And then we ran into terrible problems with NDAs because you can't sign an NDA if you're under 18. And with work experience, if anybody's under 18, you've got to have somebody use DBS check. There are huge problems here. You can overcome them, but they're quite big. I'm, I'm conscious that we're eating into the break. I want to hear from the- Sorry, John, I must have for you, didn't I? <laughs> no, absolutely. It's good to hear you're going to get your checkbook out to help some basic <laughs> anniversaries. Um, so we're going to hear from, um, Glyn, Dawn and, and James's group. I don't know whether you've you picked up on anything that hasn't been mentioned yet. Yeah, we spoke a bit about um, almost working backwards. So thinking about what students, what's their big picture and vision and taking that, like if it's a director and then breaking that down in, and almost putting together a strategy and into like, 10 bite-sized chunks, for example, and, and, and doing that approach. Um, and we also spoke quite a lot about people skills being key. Um, sort of going in as a runner or production manager, it's, it probably needs to be more emphasis on, on the people skills. Um, that, that, that idea of breaking things down was something that came up in our group as well. And Adam was particularly clearly very kind to share his career path and highlighted the appreciation that it takes time to get to that point that you want to be that kind of dream job that you want you need to do you need to take the steps along the way and take the time to get good at those different roles before you move on um, yeah so on on that John because we we were saying that you know if you want to and aspire to be a producer director break down then maybe 10 steps below and think about what that journey is. 
And I gave an example of, you know, people, if you go and do a business and banking degree, you don't come out of that degree expecting to be a bank manager or running a big finance company. You might aspire to that, but no one comes out with that expectation of doing that. Whereas I think people who do media degrees expect to come out of a media degree and be a producer director. And they've not thought about the path or the, their expectations are not met. So, I, I mean, I, I did think it was partly the expectations when they're in university, if they're being told and they're bringing in, James, sorry, I know you was going to talk about this, but you know, we, we mentioned that you know, universities are obsessed with bringing in the director of the crown and you know, th this producer, that producer. And all that's doing is it's feeding expectations to being unrealistic because they then see the, all these people think, yeah, that's what I'm going to do, that's what I'm going to do. And I think it just needs to be broken down and be realistic and have people that um, are further down the chain and who are talking about how difficult it is and their roots. Um, so I think it's almost like start from the top. What 10 jobs do I have to have before I'm going to get to that job? And then break that down realistically about how you're going to get into that and what skills you need to need to build on. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. We recently had a um, like a masterclass from the editor of the latest June film, and it was fascinating. And but the the, the names he was dropping um, was incredible and kind of beyond the expectation of any undergraduate student. Um, but just to kind of finish with the final group before we give you a, a slightly truncated break. Um, one of the things that we talked about in our group was, you know, that need to kind of appreciate how long it takes to get good um, and getting good being really important because of the respect that builds and how that will get you jobs once people know you can do um, that particular role and then you can be trusted to do the next role. Um, and we also talked about the different ways in which learning happens before going into the industry and working in the industry and how much learning in the industry is learning by doing. And it's kind of it's tacit knowledge, it's learning on the job, whereas at school and at college and at university, so much of that relies on codified knowledge. It's information you can you can write down, which you can share um, through textbooks and via teachers. And perhaps one of the issues in the skills shortages and skills gaps is that there's a disjunction between those different kinds of learning. And we need to kind of think about ways to integrate more learning by doing um, in, the, in the kind of education. Um, that we do. Just one, one thing from, from either of that. I think, you know, on the people skills, I mean, I, I suppose we, we, we were trying to underline the fact that they are so important to, the, to your entry level job. Um, and yet there seem to be very few um, aspects of any media, film, journalism, TV course that I know of that focuses on developing your personal skills, your, your you know, people, your, your handling of people, your willingness and, and, and your empathy with people and your understanding. Um, and, and so I suppose I question, I would ask all tutors to question, is everything in your degree necessary? Is everything in there necessary for your entry level roles? Or should you be devoting a bit more time um, to development of ideas, program ideas and personal uh, ability to get on with people it's not just calling people it's meeting people it's seeing people it's getting their confidence and should that not form part of your degree as much as any camera or edit trick um, after yeah. all it is what you will start off doing yeah i think that's and glenn what i was going to add there i mean james knows this that with some of the students that i've mentored over the past I've, if they were interested in documentaries i'd try and send them to the sheffield doc fest maybe get a job there, meet people, talk to people, see what the, what the broadcasters are wanting, what's in their mind. I think, you know, a lot of those things, if you actually go to those places, you might start developing those skills. That I always, I've always thought those things are there for students to go to if they want to. And I've always thought that's such an important part of doing, you know, if you're interested in communications or the media, that's such an important event to go to if you're interested in documentary making, that is. But there's others, as we know. Great. Well, I mean, those are quite sorry, 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 sorry. But focus sorry. one that all students could go to and it's completely free. Great. 
Um, I'm going to pause it there so we can have a comfort break and not least give Anna and Carol, our BSL interpreters, a, a little break as well. Um, so we'll come back again at four o'clock and we, hopefully we can pick up some of these themes in the final breakout groups, which we're going to, we're going to mix up um, a little bit to make them slightly larger. But um, we'll see you back at four o'clock. Thank you. Great. So um, I think, Laura, you're going to be leading. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, so in the next session, uh, we're going to go into breakout rooms again and picking up on our earlier discussion, uh, we want to think about if there are new systems, ways of working, processes <clears throat> that we could um, use, that we could uh, help, help to address the issues uh, that we talked about earlier. So, you know, specifics about um, things that we can do or work with each other to do. Um, I was particularly uh, impressed with the idea of demystifying and confidence, and I really am going to take that forward into literally my lecture tomorrow on the industry. <laughs> um, I think that's a really interesting, interesting idea. Um, but uh, I, uh, I will not waffle on. I think we can just, can we go kind of straight into the breakout rooms and start discussions? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Uh. So we've amalgamated two of the smaller groups um, to form a bigger one. Um, Joel messaged me to let me know he's had to deal with someone who's come around to see him, but he's going to join us again shortly. Um, so yeah, really, really interesting discussion um, before. It's always good when you run out of time because people have got lots of things to say. I think that's a good idea. Um, so has anyone got any, any, any immediate thoughts then on, on, on that question that Laura posed and about are there, are there new ways, new systems, new processes that could raise awareness um, of maybe not, not just the skills gaps and the skill shortages, but also ways in which we can um, kind of help fix them? I, mean, I, uh, I just, what Dawn was saying earlier on about uh, model, if you like, of, of, of that they're working on with Hull University of having industry input um, and, and trying to encourage um, universities to, to, to get a, a closer glimpse of industry and work more closely with industry to reflect industry's needs. And, and I'm totally conscious, John, that uh, there is a good percentage of students who are doing you know, degrees uh, at York and at Hull and other places that don't want to go into the industry. It's, but, you know, that's not, that's not who I think we're dealing with here. But those who want, want the ones who are knocking on Adam's door um, need to feel as though uh, they have a better uh, uh, idea of what the industry wants. And perhaps Dawn's model of um, involving the industry in modules that's certainly what we're trying to do via connected campus to try to 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 give better um, ideas and you know just tweak courses to to make the make the balance a little better um <coughs> dawn I'm, I'm sure will answer whether industry have got the time and the energy to be able to do that we know how how, how they struggle but that seems a good starting point anyway. yeah well i mean now that this project started quite a few years ago, kind of bringing together, it's taken a long time. It's kind of partly because I've had to focus mostly, you know, priority of members, um, but knowing that there's this, this issue that, you know, what students are learning and what, what the industry is are not really aligned. And, and I don't think, sorry, I'll just put a in my mouth. And I don't think it's necessarily the fact that um, there isn't the need to want to keep it aligned. I think that we've just moved in such a fast pace that even the industry themselves are finding it hard to catch the breath and thinking about new models, you know, particularly like co-production, deficit finance, commercializing um, content, more and more branded content that's coming in, rules, regulations associated with that. But they're where all the opportunities are. So I think what we've, we've been doing is trying to al align all of that. So the, the project that started a few years back is that 
we had, I think, maybe about 25 different indies of all different genres. We then pulled together some of the universities. So we had Westminster, Salford, uh, Ravensbourne, just working out what they felt was missing as well. And then we created, from an industry point of view, all the gaps that we felt, and then created a 10 week um, program that could ideally just slot within a, a, a media degree. And, and because it's all online with live TV, so that you'd still get that live interaction by, by TV professionals. But it's more about being a bit more structured. There's quizzes, there's, you know, so there's a way of, of marking and checking and assessing those particular modules as well. So that's that that was a way that we felt that it would enable in a very easy formatted way more industry involvement in working directly linked with with universities but also that we had um as as things changed in the industry because we've got that really tight alignment equally they would they would be passed on so they wouldn't end up with this big gap you know whereas the industry has gone a form way and, and it, you know, universities have kind of stayed the same relatively. So this way, as changes happen, we, we adapt at the same time. So as we're adapting at the same time, there's more alignment at the end um, and there's more engagement. So we've got over 300 companies already signed up to this in providing modules and workshops and talks and etc. all different levels of jobs, all different areas. Um, so what that means is also then that increases the employability side. And, and I was mentioning before, you know, I, I got an email, a letter from education minister who said this is absolutely exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for that employability to kind of tie in. So we've continued to do that. And as I say, whole, uh, uh, just trialing it for us just to, so we know the usability of it just before we launch it live for any university to be able to access, it's more about um, how does it work now? What are the areas that we need to adapt? Is it fit for purpose from a user point of view? And how can we improve it? That, that, that's really interesting. And I think that dynamism, that kind of responsiveness is really important because obviously you know, the, the, the big thing at the moment and it's gonna be even bigger thing, virtual production, that integrating that into degrees where you know, it's great that I have colleagues who teach on the production courses who used to work in the industry, but they haven't worked in the industry for 10 or 20 years. Um, so kind of picking up those sorts of skills, um, really important. Um, John, can I just add one thing? I of course. Dawn said. Um, I, think, I think it's a really good idea to work with industry, but Adam, um, I'm sure will have a, an input on this, but what, one thing that I certainly feel in Yorkshire uh, and, and, and perhaps every every corner of the country will have its own version of this. I don't always feel as though uh, the university courses reflect the, 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 the needs of the local industry. Uh, now, Adam will tell you that, you know, Air TV is built on actuality TV. It's unfolding action TV. That, that's at the core of everything they do. It's not sit someone in a corner and nicely frame them and do a you know, a, a kind of, a, I'm sure you do do that, but it, it's, it's, it's action as the core of everything. Uh, and I don't know many, and I've taught at two or three universities, I don't know many universities that reflect that. Now, Air TV are not alone. Virtually all successful indies in Yorkshire have that at their heart. They're doing New Life in the Sun. They're doing all kinds of, you know, uh, they're doing the Yorkshire Bet. Um, and, uh, and I don't think that is ever reflected. So when we're building those relationships between, when we are allowing the, you know, the, the in industry to have more input into this, uh, the universities need to listen quite carefully to what the needs of those employers are, because these are the guys whose doors they'll be knocking on first, really. You know, it's a really good point, actually, Glenn, because, you know, and I've not really thought of that, but, at, you know, all university, ideally, that city wants to retain the students when they leave not all migrate down to London and that there is the regional the regional access but if they're all thinking oh I just want to be in you know high-end drama I want to be in film and they all end up mulling around London sniffing around for jobs whereas having more engagement with with local and I guess that's harder you know 
in Hull, as an example, because there's, there's not a lot there. Adam, where are you? So we're ATV's based between Leeds and York, so not too far from Hull. Yeah. I sort of live on the way to Hull. A lot of people who work at our company at XBBC in Hull. So, um, yeah, kind of echo that's a great idea, Glenn. So it's, it's maybe just reaching out, maybe just slightly outside of, of yeah, the area. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm born and bred in Hull, still live in Hull, um, but I've not worked in Hull for 25 years. So, you know, I know the fact that there there's, there's very little jobs there. And hence why I live like a student, usually midweek out of a suitcase um, and then go back home on a weekend. So, but I do think maybe just at that further outreach, you know, if you was in Hull, then you'd maybe just uh, sort of pan probably more to Leeds, I guess, and that area. That makes sense, definitely, because it, it kind of echoes what uh, I spoke about a little bit earlier in that when, when people come in to see us at that level, they don't necessarily know about the market in Yorkshire and the types of shows that we've just talked about there. They don't know that that's if they want to stay around here, then that's the kind of programs they're going to be working on. Um, so it's kind of it's an opportunity, I think, for the for the courses to perhaps adapt their teaching in those kind of directions just to be more relevant for the jobs that are going to be coming up if they want to stick around and because we want to retain them, like you say. So it does feel like some of these ideas that have been thrown about today are an opportunity to design perhaps a slightly more vocational course for people who want to move into the industry. Like you were saying, not everybody does. So keep the kind of more academic stuff for people who want to study the academic side of, of things. But if people actually want to go and do a job, then to have all the things that we've talked about available to them as part of a course feels like a sort of opportunity for a university to kind of shine and become known for that type of course. So yeah, like, I'm no expert on these, but I feel is Ravensbourne. That's kind of a crafty type place for edit and stuff. And then I remember when I was looking for mine, my course many moons ago, like Bournemouth was the place to go for film and TV. So just to kind of, you could get, to get a reputation like that, to come fresh out of a Yorkshire university and be work ready for a Yorkshire indie would be really good. Yeah, I love that. I think that's a great, great angle. Is there a um, is there a danger though? Just playing devil's advocate, I'm not saying I disagree. Is there a danger that that then puts university courses at the whim of not just the higher education market, but also the market that indies are in? So, if if for example, that you know, um, fashion entertainment becomes less popular, and the indies in Yorkshire become smaller and some go out of business, is there is there a danger there, or does? You know, curriculum developments that Joel might be able to speak to and delivery developments and you know working through Zoom and Teams, does that make it less important that everything is so local? Well, I don't I mean, don't forget you're talking about local indies, but local indies are making, you know, nationwide programming, global programming. I mean, there's there's very few indies that just think about local television. They're thinking about producing stuff for the networks series that sell around the world so they're all thinking global content no one's thinking about you know create just because you're based in Yorkshire doesn't mean that you're only making programs for Yorkshire people you're actually making it for a, a UK wide potentially global audience yeah so just to illustrate that one of our series um a property renovation show we're covering contributors from kind of near Greenock in Scotland down to uh, Devon I think one of the projects is in and we had a call from the distributor last week and there's interest in format sales in Australia so it's it's totally UK wide and global. I, I mean I don't think anyone would, would say you know let, let's rebuild a, a, a course so it's solely focused on actuality TV it's just it's just a, a, a part of it is being aware of it. I mean, uh, Adam, um, you know, and, and Matt and Ian and Andy at Air TV will all will, will probably all say, say the same thing that, um, that that it's not often not the form of TV that people are knocking on the door. It's not, often not the form they've learned. They've not learned that fluid nature of kind of on the fly on the wall, um, that factual TV 
Uh, and and that, that's not saying let's do a three year course on it. That's just saying let, let's make sure it's reflected in that. Sort of John, I can probably chip in at this point. Um, sorry, I missed the beginning of the conversation, but I was telling the um, Don and Glenn, I was telling uh, John and Adam in the previous session that so I developed VTEX levels two and three for Pearson. Uh, I've been doing it for quite a long time. In fact, Glenn, I think we, I met you at Green Skills a couple of years back. Um, but, you know, they're vocational courses and they're quite broad in terms of content to allow for um, localization, to allow for bringing in. Um, briefs, you know, like uh, industry-led briefs um, to be adaptable, to kind of be able to go on the fly and say, well, we're going to do a, a documentary um, piece here, and then we're going to do some music video, um, you know, to kind of gain all those skills. But of course, we're talking level three. So what I'm really interested in, from your points of view um, on this panel, is how does that align with what they go on to do at university? And does it take them a step forward? or a step back in terms of, obviously they're learning more theory, they're learning more skill, but does are they learning it in the way in which they've kind of prepared to, coming from my point of view, com coming from a VTech, where they really are just getting briefs and they're producing and they're coming up with ideas um, and they're learning to work with each other and they're learning to work as part of a, a crew, you know, production crew. Um, and they are, there, there are modules that we, um, in, in the newer qualifications, and we've quite a, we've learned a lot in the last ten years, um, and we've we've listened to industry, you know, we've listened to to employers, and we've embedded modules now where the learner in level three courses has to do a piece where they investigate roles and they talk about they they try to engage with industry and they try to find out they they basically start to get some networking skills under their belt and they write about it and they talk about okay, well, I've learned these skills and this is what I'm interested in. What would I need to do to get my foot in the door? What kinds of degree courses could I go on to? What should I go on to? What do they expect in industry of me? If I, you know, can I go direct, directly into a role or do I have to go through university? Um, if so, what courses do I need to take? Who could I speak to? Who, who actually works in the industry? Who tell me how they got there? So there's, there's, this is embedded into the level three learning for them to actually do that investigation individual you know individual personalized investigation into what their interests are and how they could get there so it's space within it's it's not teacher led necessarily it is teacher facilitated um and it's really there for for kids to be able to start to say take some ownership because they're just about to embark on either a career or university um you know stepping stone so what i'm you know part of what i'm really interested in about these kinds of discussions is um how does university, you know, how do degree courses in media and, and, and production um, nurture those skills and make sure that they kind of continue on that same line of thinking towards uh, roles, you know? And I think that's what we're talking about here is kind of, you know, if, if you're in a local area, the local area, do you speak to that through the, through the degree program? Do you, are learners aware that this is the strong point of this part of the country and, you know, whilst the whole program is not devoted to that, it is, you should be aware that when you get out, these are the kind, if you're interested in getting your foot in the door, then you should, some reality TV is what we do out here, you know, or, um, you know, we do this, you know, we work on Game of Thrones up here. So, you know, you're going to have to, you know, get, get yourself immersed in that kind of filmmaking and that kind of editing and that kind of, you know, understanding of those kinds of uh, aspects of the, the industry. So anyway, it's just, just something to, to bring up, but I think it's the, the vocational kind of on on the job kind of doing mentality that needs to be nurtured as they go up through degree. And sometimes yeah. what we find is people come back and say it, it wasn't that. And other times, universities feed, feeding back to us that that's ex you know those are the kinds of learners they're getting, and they are really happy to be running with that. You know, those happy to be seeing that kids are coming through really passionate about producing and doing and you know, kind of investigating on their own as well, you know, taking some ownership. Yeah, I, th I think um, potentially an interesting example is one of the new degrees we've got at York, which is called Business for the Creative Industries. So it sits alongside the theatre degree and the film and production degree. And it's not about making television, it's about enabling television and film and theatre 
um, in interactive media. So the modules are focused on the stuff around production. So it's about the business models. It's about writing a brief. It's about writing a pitch. There's modules that we bring in from the management school so they can understand business models. And there's, a, there's modules brought in from the law school so they can understand copyright and IP and contracting and employment law and all those sorts of things. And it's it was developed, I'm sure, Glenn, you've had talks with Ed about it. Um, it was developed because of exactly because of these gaps. It's because, yeah, it's all very well doing film production, film and TV production degree and learning how to use a camera and stuff, but actually there's shortages in other areas. And that's now got people in management who teach on accounting degrees, recognizing that, oh yeah, you don't just have to go and work for Price Waterhouse Coopers or KPMG. There are other avenues um, through which you can work. So I think I guess my point is that I think I think we need to think beyond traditional ideas of what media degrees are. Um, it's not just about the production degrees or the kind of the understanding the text of media and recognizing that there are skills in other areas. Um, which I think might be useful to kind of tap into. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I think the, um, I, I worked with Ed a little bit to, to bring a couple of speakers into, uh, in, onto that course, including our old um, MD at the True North, um, who came in uh, to, to talk about the whole kind of management and financing of it. But um, no, I, I would go along, along with that completely. I, I think, but I think you have to identify what the gaps are. Um, there are some gaps that, as Dawn said right at the outset, you know, we've been talking about these gaps for years. I don't know of a production management course at a university here. There used to be one at Salford. I don't know if there still is. I think that uh, the... well, when when we were doing the um, when we were first creating the the modules, uh, we did manage to get access to three different um, sort of courses. So we, we got the pack sent from. Three, three universities that were supposedly up at the top end. And we, I shared that with all the industry and they were pretty appalled at the archaic um, teaching that, you know, the materials that were in there. Um, even one was, was doing a brief. I mean, you mentioned Joel about doing a brief. This brief was based on Pebble Mill at one and, um, <laughs> you know, Program that comes slightly after Channel Four Breakfast. I mean, we were just—I mean, it was just pretty, pretty um, appalling, really. I mean, I'm—I'm I'm a big lover of, of practical things, um, you know, common sense, data thing. I think you—you know—the um, the briefs that you was talking about, Joel. I think are great. Um, you know, the industry. We work on briefs all the time. Um, we we do loads of briefings with. I mean, we did one a couple uh, in September, our content without borders. We had 48 broadcasters, all the big American networks, Netflix, Amazon, all come in and brief in the Indies because that's what, you know, we work off briefs all the time. That's that's how the industry lives. I think when I, I mean, I, I do lectures at, um, at Westminster and one of the things, because they were doing briefs and, and I kind of, sort of just put it on its head slightly in that I said, okay, what do you do when you give when you give your students a brief? And I said, well, we give them a brief and, you know, it's as if they've got a pitch for it and then we pick the best one and then they go off and make that film. I said, well, already you're teaching them the wrong process because that's not how it works. What happens is they say, I like you. I like I like the idea. They might give you a little bit of development money or you might have to develop yourself. Then you think they're only going to give you 60 percent of that budget. So how are you going to raise another 40 percent? Um, do you go to distributors? What are your options? Is it co-production? Do you film it somewhere else to get tax incentives? Do you do that? So I think it was it's that bit that's missing. It's kind of, oh, if we come up with a great idea, then that's it. And that isn't it, unfortunately. You know, there's loads of ideas, and you know, Adam has probably pitched a million ideas, and not, you know, it's 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 not necessarily the right idea. Sometimes it's about quotas, it's about budgets, it's about, you know, what the broadcast is thinking of at that time. Um, so there's all these factors, which if, we, if we're gonna, you know, take students through realistic briefs, then I think they should be really realistic and think about the bigger picture. And then it's about budgeting and finance and, 
you know, the legals and everything else. And it's all licensing and secondary rights and windows. And, you know, so you can get quite detailed, but I think there's an element of it. If you start early, you can build all those elements in as they go along so that they understand the full process. But there's one other aspect to that, just to build on that a little bit, but again, from, from my experience teaching at, at universities, um, is that I can't think of a university project that has a client um, that, that who, who's commissioning this? Who's it for? How are you going to tailor it to their needs? Um, what they do is they make films that they like the, the sound of. Um, and I don't know, I don't, don't know anyone in the industry that does that. We, you know, no. Adam, Adam is making shows for UK TV or Discovery, and it has to be in line with what they want uh, at yeah. a price they want, at a length that they want. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not free fall TV. Is it? It's working out. What is it that they want, and how I take my creativity to really. what they need? You know? Worked in a in my previous institution in the faculty, which had architecture in it. Yeah, and they would do live briefs. They would literally work with a company who wanted something designed, and then the students would design it for them, and then they would potentially build it if it was good enough. Um, I don't know whether anything would ever get to air from a student project, but you know, if you can find a company willing to give up the time. To kind of actually give a live brief that sounds like kind of the perfect way to get that most up to date because you can, um sorry to jump oh. in but commissioner briefs are available for anybody to look at on on websites like freely available um the bbc's got a massive commissioning website uk tv's got guidelines channel four's got guidelines so if, if you're kind of working from those to design your brief and look at the kind of language they use, which is the whole thing in itself to speak commissioner. It's uh, it would be useful to kind of get get their heads around that as soon as possible, I guess. Uh, I, I was I was um, showing some students the Channel Four producer pages the other day, and their jaws just hit the floor. They didn't realise the Channel Four set it out. This is what we want. This is what we have done. This is what we're after. It needs to look like this. That was a success. That failed, and they they had no idea. That, that Paul Gaster's were that were that detailed. Now, some of the advice is incredibly vague and and uh, and, and general, as well, you know. But, but you know, it's certainly something to think about. Idea, but actually, it's not their real idea. I, I was just going to really quickly throw in there, John, sorry to um, to interject again, but I, I really, you know, I've heard I've heard ideas like this kind of thrown around quite often about very, very specific briefs where, you know, you present a classroom full of kids for an assessment, for assessment purposes, here's, here's the uh, client, this is the brief, this is the specific imagery we need, um, this is the specific target audience. We, we include all that stuff, but we broaden it out a little bit to allow for the teaching of the curriculum in different ways, because it could be um, a documentary brief. We're not gonna force all learners across the country to do a documentary assessment if they haven't been focused on documentary filmmaking. They may have been doing some, you know, something completely different. They're being do drama um, or else they're doing some, you know, they're doing short ads or things like that. Um, so it's it's got to be a brief to kind of suit all, which is really, a difficult kind of balance, but we always do set clients, um, quite broad clients. We do set target audiences so that you know kids will be trying to do it for an educational purpose, potentially for young people or for you know entertainment purposes. Um, but I'm I'm really interested in the idea of um, getting very very specific about it and whether or not that's appropriate at a certain point, but not necessarily before that point because. If, when you're in university, I think that seem, sounds like something that you should be getting familiar with is um, doing a, basically a client client set brief where you're saying, okay, this is a real brief. If you pitch it well enough, um, and that's part of it as well as pitching um, and you know delivering you know your idea for the brief. That's something else we don't necessarily um, at level two and three require because it can be seen as a limited limit to access accessibility for all learners because some of them can stand up in front of a classroom and pitch something 
um, and it's it's looked at as a limitation for others. So we we tried really hard to kind of strike that balance between getting the right skills, but also making sure that it's, it's fair when it gets to assessment point of view. So there's some things you can do that you can replicate and some things that you just can't when it comes down to fairness for, for everybody. And I think you're probably familiar with that, um, you know, a degree level as well, but I think you can get more into that when you get into degree level. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's really important, yeah. Anyone else for the last 15 seconds? Cool. I guess we could, we could jump out early. Thank you all. Okay, hi. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, excellent. Uh, all right. Um, so I just uh, remembered that I meant to be chairing this. So I was waiting on the chair to speak. <laughs> uh, so why don't we, uh, yeah, why don't we report back on uh, what was said? And I mean, I can start off uh, from uh we i was me and lambros and margaret who were chatting so just quite a small group um but yeah we we focused on kind of what what specifically can we do at the even at the level of like university assessment and at the level of ski you know schemes that we might kind of expand or build on um to address these uh these issues um so i'll just run through them quite quickly uh and please yeah do chip in lambros and margaret if i miss anything um but uh, one thing we identified that was important is uh, confidence, building in those skills, getting people to communicate and talk to other people, building networks. Um, we might do this by, um, you know, at the level of university assessment, get them to pitch things, get them to work with each other, get them to make organization part of the assessment, uh, get them to present, even though they find it absolutely terrifying, even more so after COVID. Um, so really build in those communication skills because they're very important. They may be the most important. Um, also, uh, Margaret raised the idea of Salford actually have a, a scheme where they have a pool of volunteers who are already trained student ambassadors who go off and do things, volunteer with the BBC and uh, places like that. Um, we might think of uh, kind of thinking, we might think about that a hull basically. We might kind of have a, a pool of trained ambassadors who can be kind of used for things because that is, it's easier to call on someone who has a DBS check and who has all the, the training. Um, Another thing, like we actually have the uh, Northern Media Mentor Scheme, which of course Lambros is a part of, um, which is people who've graduated from Hull, who are working in industry, who have a vested interest in Hull and kind of mentor students. Um, having a scheme like that and expanding it could be so important on giving students detailed info and um, mentorship and things like that. Um, we also uh, talked about, yeah, how we, um, we build sort of business and research skills and skills about organize organize your time into into degrees and uh, education because again that is extremely important and I don't think we foreground it enough you know like I'm always giving students essays as the main the main assignment but what I should be doing is giving them an essay and then stuff that makes them organize themselves <laughs> research projects things like that um one other the final thing I'm going to mention is a great idea that Lambros uh, drew my attention to, which is uh, an example of a student who was a geography student and thought about switching to media. But Lambros said, well, you, um, your, your specificity of skills is actually what's useful, so don't do a media degree. <laughs> um, but then uh, I think they managed, you managed to work it so that um, that student could do one media module. And I just wondered, yeah. Um, this is very specific to Hull as well. Like, is there the, the possibilities of taking experience from students from different areas, from STEM, from geography, and giving them the option or opportunity to work with media and film students, share experience, um, and maybe kind of get some experience for their CVs. Um, so yeah, those were the kinds of things that we kind of came up with. Uh, and if I've missed anything, uh, do chip in, Lambros. No, 
Well, well J James organised that module for that student for that geography student, so maybe he can tell us how he did it. Well, James. I mean, j just the the broader point. Um, yeah, I mean, Molly came and did my uh, representing reality module, but th this is a good point. Like. Um, universities one thing that they have potentially in their power to use is is to develop connections whereby media um, departments become something in the manner of service providers to um, science departments and they help communicate the stories of of science and I know Lambros this is something that we talked about specifically at Hull um, it, it's just the big the big barrier there is um, institutional cultures sadly you know the 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 sort of separate citadels of the different academic departments and as with everything that we've been talking about it, it partly relies upon just having good reliable connections with people in those areas so that you can set things up and then keep them running year after year but that's definitely something that is worth considering further um yeah uh so I think James Wilson, you'll be more aware of how many groups there were and who was in them. I'm not actually. Um, who was the, uh, can we hear back from another group? Uh, maybe John, uh, the group you were in? First of all, fantastic that a geography student wanted to do that. I used to teach geography. I'm a geographer. I won the geography prize at school. Geography is the best subject. Um, and I work in the media department. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, that's actually the, the idea that James was talking about, about different modules is that something that york's moving to um we're reorganizing the teaching and there's potential for third year students to pick modules from different departments which will be fantastic for the students and nightmare for the staff because we'll get third year students who haven't done first and second year modules and so we'll have to completely potentially dumb down the content um but um our group um was um glenn dawn uh, joel and adam and yeah, Dawn can't be here because she's going to re rehearsal for BAFTA. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Um, the, the, the kind of theme within our group was needing kind of education provision to reflect the state of the industry. So whether that be um, universities and colleges acknowledging and reflecting the kind of um, film and TV and computer games that are made in the region um, so that there is a clear connection to production companies and a clear... Um, connection to kind of what's happening and a pathway um, into potentially local jobs, which will then help retain students, which is something that all universities are trying to do outside of London is to stop the brain drain um, to the southeast. Um, also, um, Dawn talked about kind of industry developed modules um, or programmes which can be dropped into degrees. So kind of 10 week programmes that come from industry and reflect the state um, of play at the moment and that can be responsive so that students aren't being taught by people that worked in the industry 20 years ago um, and I'm sure they've been really important skills but they don't won't have experience of things like virtual production or XR content um, so that that link um, really report important and then the third way to reflect industry is using live briefs so whether work, working with a local company um, or as Adam pointed out just downloading them from the broadcasters um, and using those as teaching elements rather than things that might be out of date. Um, Dawn cited one, which was something for Pebble Mill, um, which obviously isn't very um, current, and the mode in which it was delivered as well, um, not very current. So that was that was the kind of the, the key theme: is reflecting the state of the industry through the through the education. If I can just jump in, I, I think that working with the local industry um, it is so important, even if a good proportion of your students will be. You know, we'll go to London, go to Manchester, go to Bristol, go go home, or or whatever. Uh, it is about understanding uh, the needs um, of, of that local company. And and just on that, at the at the last Connected Campus meeting that, that James uh, was at, where we had the we had Paul Stead, who runs Datamex Studios, one of the biggest employers in our region, makes the Yorkshire Vet, makes Winter on the Farm that's on at the moment, makes the nation's favourite biscuit, makes anything a huge variety of programs that they make. Something like 150 people were working there. They're now part of E1, uh, a real global uh, community. And when we asked him what his biggest problem was with students, he said, they don't get enough applications. No one, no one applies to me. They, they, all, they apply to 
you know, documentary makers in London, or, or, or but, but they don't apply to uh, one of the biggest employers in Yorkshire. They don't knock on his door. Um, very few, um, uh, which is extraordinary. So, I, and I think that part of that responsibility on, on tutors is to make, who, who are these people? Who, whose door can you knock on? What do they do? What do they want? What, are, you know, how can you look, how can you shine? How can you stand out from them? Um, uh, and I think it's, it is part of your job um, to say, how and where do you go searching for work? Actually, I, I do think that's the important part, which is often overlooked. Mm, thanks, Lynn. Um, okay, so uh, I'm informed there were three breakout rooms. Uh, so um, shall we hear back from the final room? I guess that's, uh, that was me, um, Alison, Joshua, Scott and Jenny. Um, so the, the turn our conversation took, and it was partly because um, Joshua set us off thinking about whether our, the ways that we design learning experiences and assessments sort of replicate industry conditions. So like, do we give live briefs, et cetera? We were talking basically about what I would call the learning environment and the assessment methods for students and the ways in which these um, might best prepare students for, for the realities of the industry. So that would include things like um, making students think about rights clearances if, if their work is ever gonna sort of see the, the public light of day um, and building that into something they're required to think about as part of the experience, um, scheduling budgets, um, having having real life templates for for these kinds of things that they can look at and compare, um, and also w I raised the issue um, about not designing risk or or dead ends or mistakes or conflict too much out of um, the process that they go through, so that so that they learn those things about about um, the process of production as well and the tension that's inherent between designing. A learning experience that isn't going to completely fray the nerves and, and destroy the confidence of, of the learner but also it's so it is that it's that balance of um challenge authentic challenge um, combined with support so that you're able to kind of step out of the, the experience and say this is what's happening but don't worry but also give them that experience in the first place um so yeah not not designing out all the bumps in the road that that form the learning it relates back to john's point about the difference between sort of being able to theoretically write about experiences and so on and actually living the experience and and being able to respond appropriately within a given um real world situation those those were a lot of the things we talked about we we were talking about um um sort of the fact that sometimes film projects they're delivered in the space of 10 days and sometimes they're a slow burn where they get developed over the course of a year and that students should be aware of both models and should be given some sort of training and understanding of of how to cope with those um i think those are the main things we talked about if anyone else wants to chip in with extra stuff um, feel free i think james it's interesting what you said because last year again going back to the experience I had with the other mentors as part of the whole uni thing, there's, a, there's that module about work-based experience, isn't there? And of course, they couldn't go out to any companies. So one, one of our mentors, who's in fact an exec producer with the BBC, he came up with a, something I think he was working on, which I think was a BBC Three pitch. And he asked the students, he gave it to them like a pitch, and he kind of supervised it every other week or however often he spoke to them. And I, I think, you know, well, one of the students, I think, we did really well at that. And again, maybe that, that you know, yeah. maybe we can do that as part of our mentoring group, but we can do more of that because it, it's real stuff. It's what he was working on. And after all, he's the commissioner as well. So blimey, he knows what he's looking for, doesn't he? So it's, yeah. you know, if we've got those connections, we should use them. Yeah, just, just to very briefly respond to that. Thanks, Lambros. That's kind of reminded me of just another discussion point that we talked about, and it was, I was talking about the way that the Screen Yorkshire um, connected campus provision has evolved and that um, a lot of the time now we, one thing that students really benefit from is getting feedback from industry 
representatives on their work in progress. Um, so they will um, perhaps Richard will come and sit in on pitches, for example, and, and the, the students will get a bit of feedback and get an endorsement of um, what it is that they're doing and um, how that's quite powerful and also less of a commitment on the part of the person um, from outside the university delivering that experience. So that's a really valuable um, sort of model and, and way to way to bring the classroom and the um, beyond the classroom together. One example of that, James, um, just briefly that we're doing with Connect the Campus is with Sheffield Hallam, um, where uh, we've created with kind of in partnership with Welcome to Yorkshire. It was like a student film competition uh, that had to have a Yorkshire theme uh, and the client was Welcome to Yorkshire. And if, and if you got into the shortlist of this, all of the, the three best films would be shown on Welcome to Yorkshire the, and, and there would be a competition, there would be a winner. So you had a clear client, which often isn't the case at university. You know who you're aiming at, you're tailoring it for them. Um, you, you know that Welcome to Yorkshire want a nice fluffy, um, a positive film about Yorkshire. They don't want it to be too, too dark and, and dreary. Um, but, you know, we had several professionals coming in to help that in development, um, in, in shooting, in editing. Um, and they pitched directly at us uh, and we tried to give them um, help. So, we, you know, that's, we are one way in which you're getting industry in, in uh, but I'm sure there are many other ways that, that, that would be helpful. I think the feedback thing is really, really good. Um, and another point on the feedback, we did some work with animation students and we're getting animation professionals to give feedback. And the students found it really difficult. And we had to do a big session with students about how important it was to take feedback and to learn from it rather than just thinking you were being criticized. And in the end, it worked really well, but it was quite a complicated process, but it was really good. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Um, so this plenary uh, is scheduled to end at five. Um, so we've kind of debriefed and come back as a group. Um, is there anything that um, we've got about 10 minutes? Are there any other uh, points anyone wants to raise or any questions anyone has before we break off for the day? Can I just uh, say Sorry, go on, Lambert. I was going to say, um, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this because uh, as, a, as a kind of volunteers group at Hull Uni, at the, our mentoring group, we're, we're trying to do a lot of the things that are already happening. It's just as we don't know they're happening, right? And a group like this, we were talking about networking, weren't we? We're talking about how we can help each other. And I want all your emails, actually, because I, you know, the next thing that comes up there's so many of you there. I'm going to say to that group, well, you're that symposium I went to. There's someone here that will know about that. Why don't we ask them? You know, and um, this, this is, I mean, this is the great benefit of today, apart from hearing all the great things that everyone's doing, just the way we've connected. And I, I for one, would like to carry on if we've all got each other's emails and stuff. You know, things will come up and I'd like to be able to email different people and say, hey, you know, you talked about that, why? Right? Can you help us? Yeah, and I've learned such a lot today because I get too, inve too involved in the academic side of things and I realise that doesn't reflect reality. <laughs> so it's nice to have that reminder. Um, uh, so um, thank you, Lambros. Uh, I think, John, you had your hand up. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say thanks for everyone's input. Um, and Jude and Pip from the Skills and Training Scheme uh, work stream on sign couldn't be here today, but they'll be watching the recording. And I'm sure they will find this all incredibly useful. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had plenty of ideas um, for potential research projects. Um, and also thank you to Anna and Caroline for their um, help as well. Um, that's yeah. at the extent um, of our language. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I'm gonna kind of sort of, uh, yeah, thank everyone at the end. <laughs> Before we go, I want to just rudely like end the meeting. But I noticed that Adam's got his hand up. Did you want to uh, chip in? Just add one brief point circling back to what Margaret was saying about feedback and um, that sort of chimes with an experience we've had recently um, so I'd echo that point that people should get used to the idea that at least 99 out of 100 ideas will fail 
and kind of taking the feedback that you get on board to like we've got a chap with us at the moment who is an absolute ideas factory and that is absolutely brilliant but he's a bit baffled why channel four haven't commissioned his latest idea <laughs> immediately and we're not making it so um it's kind of he's getting to know that process and maybe that's one of the things you do learn on the job but it would be cool if that was sort of introduced early yeah. I just wanted to yeah. mention that. and you know adam it's interesting what you said because um we were talking about kids that lack confidence in, in quite a lot of the things we've said now if you know if you start making your application you're constantly rejected you know someone needs to point that out to you actually this is normal you know you're going to get more rejections than you are acceptances. Don't take it personally. You know, if 5,000 students apply to do that Channel 4 course, there's only six places, work it out. You know, the chances are you're not going to get the gig. I think we've just got to help them, haven't we, in terms of don't be knocked by that. And it, so if you're already suffering from a confidence thing, it isn't going to help, is it, if you're constantly being rejected? Yeah. I don't just yeah. mean, I just mean for for graduates generally going for jobs, not just within a production company yeah. where you're putting ideas. I mean, yeah, the same thing applies to academia, which mirrors the creative industries in the sense that there is always a precarity gap between graduation and, and job. And there is often a lot of rejections, an awful, awful, awful lot. <laughs> um, we haven't really had a chance to touch on the more sort of economic precarious aspects of the industry today, which I regret, but I hope that we will yeah. do that um, at some point, maybe with in conjunction with sign. Um, James, uh would you like to say something yeah thanks um i mean, I, I know you're going to thank everyone at the end laura I'll, I'll just say a quick thank you and and what i've been thinking about is that when when we thought about this um this event we were we were kind of envisaging sort of the journey the journey my arms are beyond the screen that a student goes through a young person goes through from the earliest age of like being 12, 13, thinking maybe I want to go into the creative industries, although they wouldn't call it that if they were 12. <laughs> and then up to the point where they sort of graduate and get the job. So so that was kind of the idea of bringing everyone together. And I think um, over the past few years at Hull, we've, we've gotten gradually better at working closely with um, industry representatives or at least people who get us in the same room with with people from industry but if we're thinking of this as as a big journey something that I'm very conscious of and, and want to devote more more thought and, and attention to is what happens before they get to us because a lot of the issues that we spontaneously raised at the beginning were common across um, all age groups that we work with so it's this idea of being more aware of the different kinds of, of roles available the stuff that Margaret identified right at the beginning and I'm, I'm not sure exactly how it would work and whether whether what we're calling for is a structural um, sort of intervention that would enable these working relationships to work better or whether it's simply a case of universities cultivating better relationships and more concerted relationships with um, Pearson, for example. So we've got more knowledge and an exchange of information about what goes on in our different sectors because they're two, two steps on the same journey. And likewise with um, local sort of level three education providers. I suspect it, what it will probably come down to is, is good communication and, and good sort of relationships on an individual level rather than something structural. And I don't know exactly how that will unfold, but I think it's, it's a very important part of, of piecing together the journey and thinking about the overall picture. Thanks, James. <clears throat> uh, so I just want to say that I have found this tremendously useful um, and I found the chat uh, really invigorating, especially the kind of detailed discussions we had in the breakout rooms. Um, I'm definitely going to carry a lot of stuff from today forward uh, in terms of like, yes, yeah, schemes that we might come up with at Hull. Uh, but I hope, I, I hope that you all have also kind of found this useful, um, connecting with people. And I'd like to really, really just genuinely thank you so much for giving your time. Like you've given a whole afternoon to us. <laughs> and you've come along and chatted, um, contributed, brought your experience, brought your skills. Um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. <laughs> um, so thank you. And thank you also to our, again, to our uh, BSL interpreters uh, and to James Wilson and John Sorgs and everyone on the sign side for organizing this and making sure it went really smoothly because if I'd been organizing it, I guarantee you it would not have gone smoothly. So thank you so much. <laughs> um, so unless, uh, yeah, unless anyone else has any other 
business, then um, I think we can probably uh, call it a day there. Is that all right, John? Yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, well, thanks so much, everyone. Uh, we'll be in touch again to kind of say thanks and ask if there's any follow-up stuff uh, you'd like to ask.